Mike Gleason here, and we have this thing uh, covered baseline to baseline. We have uh, Jay Williams, a two-time National Player of the Year. We have Billy King, former president and general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers, Len Elmore, who was drafted in the first round by the NBA and the ABA, and uh, Chad Ford of ESPN.com, who spent a lot of time with these players over the last uh, 60 days. And Jay, from a player's perspective, what are some of the emotions they're feeling right now? Well, some players are going to be in a glass case of emotions because they're going to be very nervous. There is going to be an element of tension today for some of these players, but some of the attributes I'm really looking forward to from a lot of these young guys is their ability to compete. You know, I can get a chance to compete against a lot of players in three on three, four on four, or five on five kind of game scenarios, but you are going to get a chance to compete in individual skills. Uh, how are you going to be? Are you going to be a leader? Are you going to be pushing your players behind you? And are you going to want to win at each and every single drill? So that, from a player's perspective, that's what you want to see from the players, but I'm very interested to see from a GM perspective what they're looking for. Well, from a GM's perspective, they're trying to figure out these guys, how well they're going to be taught, how, how well they're going to listen to the guys, new drills, new settings, new surroundings. The second thing the GMs are going to be here for is really trying to figure out trades. A lot of the draft day trades happen here, start here, and finish on draft day. So those are the two things, really, the GMs are trying to accomplish. Len, every year there's the, uh, the first round locks, but uh, give me a couple of names of guys that uh, could really solidify their status in the draft if they play well here. Well, we're talking about some guys who obviously are on the first round bubble but have shown dominant skills on the college level, but here they have to round out those skills, show that they can do more than the things that they're dominant doing. And we're talking about guys like Jordan Crawford, Darrington Hobson, and Dominique Jones. These are guys that I think if they show well in this particular group, have a chance to crack that first round. Chad, over the last 60 days, you've been traveling all over the place watching these players. Whose stock is rising? Well, I, I, a couple of guys have been working out, actually, already for NBA teams. A guy like Paul George of Fresno State went in, worked out against Xavier Henry, worked out against James Anderson, came out with rave reviews, comes from a small school. He's helped his stock. Look at a guy like Avery Bradley. NBA uh, teams loved him as a high school player, went into Texas, really kind of had an up-and-down season for Texas, but he has that athletic quickness that guys like Russell Westbrook and Rajon Rondo have. And then the guy from Nevada, Luke Babbitt, I'm not sure exactly what he's done since the end of the season, but every time I talk to NBA GMs, it seems like he's moved up five spots on their big board. It's the 2010 NBA Draft Combine. It's broken down into five different groups. 54 players were invited to the combine this year. You'll have the uh, combination guards or the point guards, the twos or shooting guards, the small forwards or threes, the power forwards, and of course the centers. And uh, let's go down now and uh, listen uh, to John Lucas as he explains the first drill. Coach Lucas, Coach Brown, start him off. Okay, let's go. Uh, we're going to go crossovers first, each cone. You're going to come up the cone, crossover, speed up to the next one, crossover, right to left, first side. Before here, Four, five here, four with Tony. Anderson, Crawford, Harris, Henry, Jones here. Hobson, Landisburg, Ratton, Stevenson down there. Let's Hurry up, let's go. Now, well, John Lucas uh, giving out the instructions on the first drill. This will be the right. twos or the shooting right. guards uh, coming up first, and it's going to be a, a, a dribbling drill. Well, I, I look forward to seeing how some of these guys, how low to the ground they're going to be. Are they going to be sharp? Are they going to go through the drills hard? I think a lot of times you see players do individual workouts kind of coast through the drills because it's, it, it's not a real game. But I've always known the way to practice is practice at game speed. So I know for a gym, you have to be looking at the way they're competing. Are they going through the skills individually very hard? Well, and this is where you're trying to figure who can really handle the ball because a lot of guys can take one dribble and shoot two dribbles. But when you got to go up to the cones and cross over, a lot of guys cannot do this. Some guys can do a lot better than others. But this is where you're trying to see how they can handle it. Are their eyes up? Are they you know, looking up the floor rather than looking at the basketball? And the one thing as a gym you got to take into consideration, these guys are nervous. This is their first time you've got, as you said, Pat Riley, Jerry Sloan, Larry Bird in the gym. These guys are really, really nervous. So once their nerves calm down, I think you'll see them go a lot smoother as well. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a question of points. The first drill of the first day, maybe of the rest of their lives, you're going to see who can really get through this drill without making the mistake. You know, the thing that stands out to me is, obviously, we got our two guards here, Evan Turner, uh, who would be the number two pick in the draft. He's not here. We've had a number of guys who are going to not go through these drills today. Uh, their agents have decided that they're going to just wait for the combine tomorrow. But there are some good prospects here. you got Xavier Henry uh, out of Kansas, who was a dynamite freshman. A lot of NBA teams are interested in him. I think if you look at the list, uh, you know, another guy that really uh, stands out to me is James Anderson of Oklahoma State. Big time scorer, guy that I think a lot of NBA teams are very, very interested in. And the sleeper to me is Lance Stevenson, a guy who was a big time high school player, went into Cincinnati, had an up and down season, but 
he has an NBA body, he has an NBA type of game, and I think he's going to be a guy that's going to get a lot of close scrutiny from NBA GMs as they watch him go through these drills. You know what, Chad, as, as I watch these drills, a couple guys I'm very excited to, to see how they handle the dribbling aspect of the skill workout. James Anderson, Xavier Henry, Andy Rollins, three guys that can shoot the basketball extremely well from the outside, but throughout the regular season be able to knock down that long-range jump shot, but will they be able to handle the basketball and create shots for themselves off the dribble? Good shot of Dominique Jones of uh, the University of South Florida. Now, he's projected to go in the second round. I thought it was interesting, guys. He said he was thinking about going back to school, but he kept hearing second round, and he took that as a challenge, and that's motivational fuel for him. Well, it is, and uh, you'd be amazed how many guys that end up in the second round end up having great pro careers. Carlos Boozer, Gilbert Arenas. You know, those guys were taken in the second round and end up having a great career. Paul Millsap with Utah. So a lot of guys do take that as motivation that – if, you know, if they're going to go to the second round, even if they get drafted, they're going to get to a team and prove themselves. A lot of times I think if you're drafted in the second round, usually teams really, really want you. They're not looking at potential because you're looking at guys that are juniors and seniors tend to be in the, in the second round. Well, I tell you, when you talk about Dominique Jones thinking about going back to school and trying to accept the challenge of coming here, this is a guy that's been in the top five in scoring in the Big East over the last couple of years and probably would have been on his way to being the most dominant scorer in the Big East this year. But then again, you know, guys wonder, and this is the dilemma, do you, do you get too old for, for the NBA if you stay an extra year? <laughs> I mean, look at Andy Routens. He was a fifth-year senior last year. He may be the oldest guy, one of the oldest guys here. Had a terrific season this year. But again, the question mark is going to be, is he too old right, give me three at this long, point? Three, you three, look at Dominic three. Jones, a little bit undersized, not three, the three, most explosive three. athlete in the world. But I think with ball. NBA teams, there's always trends. Right here, and you look at a guy like Marcus Thornton last year out of LSU, had a very similar college career, went into the New Orleans Hornets, drafted in the second round, really exploded in the second half for them. You see a lot of comparisons between Dominic Jones and Marcus Thornton. Well, we can't talk basketball without Andy Katz also joining us here in Chicago. Right now, let's uh, check in uh, with Andy, who's standing by with Chris Wallace. Andy? That's right, Mike. Chris Wallace, President and General Manager of the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, this is the second year the NBA has tried this new format. So I appreciate the promotion. I was vice president when I left the hotel today. <laughs> okay. <Thanks. laughs> <laughs> well, we, got, we you know, maybe after after this weekend, uh, getting a good selection. Right. What are you guys looking for in this newer format in the last two years? Well, it's not just what we see going on on the floor uh, at Attack Athletics, this great facility. We're going to each team interview around 18 players, which is very important because you don't always get these players into your town for a workout. Uh, sometimes there's commitments from other teams and they jump out of the draft process, players get injured. Maybe their representatives doesn't feel you're a good fit or they're not going to slide back to you. So to have that variety of players, for, to, to talk to them, actually get to meet them is important. And in the physical examinations, that may seem mundane, but that becomes crucial at the 11th hour around the draft. So you have all these players taking physical examinations. We don't have to track them down, bring them in and take physicals at our place. It's good for the player, too, because they're not getting worn down, working out, traveling and taking numerous physical examinations the last week as well. So of the three issues here, the actual on-court, the medical, and the interviews, is the on-court almost third in that, well, that rank? The on-court, since you're not seeing five-on-five -five actual basketball, and there's not contact here like there are at the individual team workouts at our own facilities, or the group workouts we're going to see starting next week in Minneapolis and then in June in New Jersey, there's only so much you can gain from just watching individual non-contact workouts. I mean, it's nice they're here and you get to see them in the flesh and that sort of thing. But there'll be more revealed later on. But again, you may not get to see all these guys later on for a variety of reasons. So it's one-stop shopping here to actually see players, get to meet them, and then they take that physical examination. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. Do uh, did I get one of these uh, ESPNU shirts, these lovely lime green shirts? Is a well, actually, as a gift for appearing today, I'd love to have one. Tomorrow, I think we have Memphis. You can okay. check those out. But, guys, when we go back to you, there are workouts that are going to be happening next week in Minnesota and one later in June, as he was mentioning, in New Jersey. Those are the workouts, actually, where the GMs and all the player personnel directors will really see these guys going head-to-head -head a little bit more often. Back to you. Thanks, Andy. And uh, they were talking about the, uh, the medical examinations last night. You guys brought up a very interesting point about the one. Juan Blair of Pittsburgh. Yeah, well, he was here where he found out he didn't have the ACL ligament in his knee. 
But those are really good because when you get in the draft, sometimes there may be a guy that's not on your radar. All of a sudden, you make a trade, and you're going to go draft him. So you want to go to your doctors and say, what do you have on them? So they have the medical files on all these players. So it is very important that all the guys do come here. If they need an MRI on something, they do get it here. He'll still be going corner baseline draft. Here we go. These are the uh, twos or the shooting guards uh, going for about 40 or 45 minutes. Again, it's broken down into five groups. And I want to get back to, uh, very quickly to something uh, Billy said. I thought it was interesting as a fan, as a, a, a novice compared to you guys. You talked about the second-round pick. Uh, when they take you in the second round, they must really like you. You always hear, okay, the guaranteed money is in the first round. If you have college eligibility and you're not going to go in the first round, go back to college, but you're saying that's not necessarily true. Yeah, generally guys who go in the top half of the second round, some guys even go later, end up getting a guarantee, either sometimes partial or full guarantee. If you like a guy, say for instance, Todd McCullough, we got him in Philadelphia. We liked him enough. I guaranteed him the first year and partially guaranteed him second year because I didn't want him to become a good player and we end up losing his rights or have to match a contract. So if you find a guy you like, because the number is so small, it's still a lot of money, but it's smaller compared to the guarantee of the first round. So a lot of times you need those on your roster when you get close to the luxury tax. You want a guy making $300,000, $400,000 rather than $800,000 or $1 million when you get close to that tax. And it's also really dependent upon need as well. I mean, you know, you have guys who have prioritized who they want and what they want, what position they want to fill. But when they can fill another position, certainly they'll draft a guy who might have dropped and still want to guarantee him, as you mentioned, just because they need that. And when you don't have a first-round pick like San Antonio did and they get Juan Blair, he's essentially their first-round pick. You know, you know, we talk about first-round picks, second-round picks, but it's really about fit. You know, agents obsess about that, players obsess about that, partly because of the money involved and what have you, but it's that second contract that counts in the NBA. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, you look at a guy like Russell Westbrook, he goes forward to Oklahoma City, it's a great fit for him, he gets to play right away. He gets drafted by another team, maybe Larry Brown's his coach or something like that. He could be sitting at the end of the bench for two years. So it's not about what team... Uh, it's not about where you go in the draft. It's about getting with the right team that's going to develop you, give you an opportunity to play. And I think players and agents should focus way more than, on that than the number they go in the draft. Chad, why are you picking on my man? Larry Brown? <laughs> <laughs> you, you play for him. That's not going to be the last Actually, time. Probably, probably one of the best coaches I ever yeah. played for because of his, his penchant for fundamental soundness. Yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, it, it really comes down to being able to play. And that's what, that's what it's all about. Some guys would rather be free agents to find that right fit yeah. as opposed to draft where the rights are secured. Well, and the great thing about it, you think back in the draft, when LeBron James went number one, Darko Milicic went number two, Carmelo three, you know, didn't Bosch and Dwayne Wade, Darko just happened to be on a team that didn't need him, and he didn't play for two years. And really, he hasn't had his niche in the NBA that whole time. And, and if he'd have went maybe later in the draft, he probably would have played and maybe had a better career. That's Why you got to bring up Darko Milicic right away? <laughs> <laughs> you know, guys, the thing is, too, everybody gets obsessed with this number one pick. But, I mean, really, since 1985, there's only been two players that have been drafted number one who have won an NBA championship. And that's been David Robinson in, 80, in 87 and then Tim Duncan in 97 for the same team. I mean, so it's these second-round guys. I, from a guy who played being a second pick, I had to go every day against Roger Mason, who was a second-round pick for Chicago. And it was a battle because every day he was playing for a paycheck. He was playing for his family. And I was too, but I had a lot as things that were a lot more out of the cushion factor, whereas he didn't, and he fought every single day and pushed called, me to be a better player. security. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. well, you, and you know what? And you talk about guys, Chad did guys not getting, or I think one day, not getting drafted. Look at Wes Matthews, starts with Utah Jazz, not drafted. So there are guys here that may have a bad Chicago, may have a, really have a bad month of May and June, and not get drafted could end up becoming a very good, productive NBA player. So it's not end-all, be-all if you don't do well here. There's still more basketball. Let's take a look at uh, some of the notable guys that uh, maybe slipped through the lottery or even the draft for that matter. Rajon Rondo, I remember we were down in Orlando doing the NBA pre-draft camp at the time when they used to play five-on-five five, and the NBA people, the execs like yourself there, Billy, uh, saying that Rondo should be here because we're not sure if there's certain things about his game. Well, things have certainly worked out pretty well for Rajon Rondo, but here's some of the names that uh, have actually made an impact in the NBA that uh, slipped through the draft. Well, you know, it's funny. You look at Rondo. A lot of those guys that last night, a lot of guys, people will try to figure out what they can't do. Rather than say, Rajon Rondo can push the ball, it competes. Everybody kept saying, I don't know if he can shoot, so they won't guard him in the NBA. Well, he's proved he can play in the NBA. Carlos Boozer, his size, is he big enough to play power forward? Is he a little overweight? Well, he's proved he can play in the NBA. But I think a lot of times GMs go in and they try to figure out what a guy can't do rather than say, Kyle Korver, great shooter, draft him. And I think it's unfair to lock guys into a certain position. 
oh, he's not a point guard, or he's a tweener, or he's going to be a three or a four. Listen, if a guy is a basketball player and has a basketball IQ, and he gets put in the right situation, he can fit in anyway. We talked about that before we got on the air, Len, about basketball IQ, standing over there watching some of these players. You say that, but uh, is that part of the equation? I mean, it seems like potential, talent, athleticism always seems to rise above that. Yeah, and it really, again, comes down, essentially it comes down to skills. And people want to see skills, but they also want to see athleticism and certainly potential. And depending on the need, depending on whether they can wait for somebody, they'll put potential ahead of skills and athleticism. They need somebody to play right away. I suspect that skills and athleticism are important. So. Well, I think a lot of people, a lot of gyms are afraid of being Sam Bowie, where you take yeah, Sam yeah. Bowie over Michael Jordan, who is athletic, so i got to take a big guy. So I think everybody's afraid of making that mistake. I don't want to pass on the potential. That guy that could potentially be that superstar, that franchise guy. It's easy when it's a Tim Duncan at number one. You take Tim Duncan or David Robinson. It's when you start trying to figure out in the draft which guys fit, which guys work hard. And that's why a lot of them psych tests, medical records, combine, their season. All that goes into, combine, and into a book and really as you, as you go and make your selection. I think you got to be careful not to overemphasize any one of those points. Like, for example, you know, a guy like James Anderson, he is not going to look as great as some of these other guys in the drills today. He's not, he's not as explosive athletically. Um, he's not, he doesn't maybe do some of the things that some of these other guys do. But, you know, in Vegas, when I was watching these guys at drills, James Anderson didn't really stand out. Then they start playing three on three. This guy gets to the basket every time he finishes at the basket. He's a big-time scorer in college basketball. So you've got to take all of those things into equation. Some guys are players and not workout guys. Some guys, we see this with the European guys, some guys are workout monsters. They're amazing in workouts, and you put them on the court in five-on-five, five, they don't know how to play. Dominique Jones really came on strong toward the second half and really became an NBA draft player. What changed with Dominique in the second part of the season? Well, I thought his focus went towards doing whatever he can to help his team win. And uh, when he did that, I thought his team rallied behind him, and uh, he took us to some different heights. When did you realize that he might be making this kind of a jump? Well, we talked about it last year in the sophomore season. He still averaged about 18 points a game as a sophomore, and, and we really talked about uh, going into his junior year of trying to position himself where uh, it, he'd have an option to go to the NBA or stay in college. This is the first time uh, the NCAA moved back that uh, rule to May 8th instead of mid-June. What are the chances if the old rule had been in existence that Dominique might be just testing right now rather than already in the draft? Uh, I think he would still be testing. Uh, I, I think he would want to know for sure he's in a solid position. I think he's doing really, really well. The feedback I've been getting on Dominique has been terrific. Uh, I expect him to be somewhere right in that first round mix, but uh, you never know. And uh, I think uh, he would have taken it all the way to the end. How nervous is he today? Well, I think he's got a little tension to him, and uh, he wants to play well. He's a competitive kid. Uh, I, I think in a format where he's going head-to-head -head in competition, I think he's going to excel a little bit more in drills. I think he's going to be thinking about things a little bit. I right, appreciate it, Stan. Okay. Stan Heath, head coach of South Florida, with Dominique Jones, as I know Mike and Len saw a lot of him this past season, really emerged as a potential first-round pick. All right, thanks a lot, Andy. And he's uh, one of Len's sleepers this year in the draft. Yeah, I mean, this is a young man, as I said, who is a dominant scorer in the Big East. And, you know, you can't discount that. There's a way. The Big East one of the toughest conferences in America. And this is a guy who could put points on the board. So you have to be intrigued as to why and how. Certainly might be a little bit undersized, might be under-publicized, under-noticed. You know, the one thing, Lynn, it's always funny because we did it on the college, level, which was true. But some of those same college players in the Big East especially are going to be pro players that he did against. So your point is valid in the fact that, you got to go back and look at what this kid sure. did in college and say, if he's able to do it in the Big East, which I think is a very physical conference, and it was a tough conference this year, and he's one of the top scorers, I think you can't discount that. And I think he's somebody that will need the perfect fit for him to fit in. You know, guys, my, my freshman, my rookie year, excuse me, we got a chance to play Dallas, and Steve Nash was at Dallas. And we are talking before the game, and he says, Jay, don't worry about everything else in the game. Just do what you do. If you do what you do, you'll be fine. I think Dominic James, he does what he does. I mean, you see, he doesn't come out, he doesn't attack, he doesn't shoot the basketball right away. He does a great job of dipping that shoulder, using all 220 of that of those pounds and that strength to attack the driver. And he can get to the rim, and he can get to the free throw line 10 to 11 times a game, and he can be a heck of a defender. If he does those things, 
he's going to make a roster. He's going to do extremely well in NBA, in my opinion. You know, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think that's a fault for a lot of these guys in workouts, right? They want to they want to go in and show NBA teams uh, that they're better at a weakness than teams think they have instead of emphasizing their strengths. Like I was in the gym in Vegas, James Anderson, who I think is a pretty good shooter, but not, you know, not a lights out shooter. Instead of just shooting at the NBA three-point line, he was standing six feet back from that and shooting from 30 feet, and he was missing. And, you know, I came up to him and asked him afterwards, I wanted to show you my range. Well, if you're going to show me your range, you better be able to hit that shot. You just look at when the NBA moves that line back, the shooting percentages drop. You move back another six feet. There's very few guys in the league that can hit that shot. So do what you do well. Well, I think that's a great point. That's a great say. If you're a carpenter, then don't go work on the plumbing. (laughs) Work with the wood. Welcome back to Chicago. Andy Rottens of Syracuse knocked down 41% of his threes for the Orange this year. And right now the twos, or the shooting guards, are working on that three. And guys, of course, uh, the biggest thing is that college three versus the NBA three. Well, you know, I think it has a lot bigger of a difference now, um, excuse me, before, because the college line was so much closer before. But now since the college line is kind of intermixed with it, uh, the overseas line, it works out a little bit easier. But still, one of the things I really look for for a lot of these guys when they shoot from the NBA range is their elevation, their lift off the ground. You have to get good lift off the ground, and it's not going to be that same kind of set jump shot. Now those mid-range jump shots are a lot easier because you're shooting a ball from so much deeper. But the real shooters adjust, yeah. and we've seen it. I mean, you guys, as Duke alum, you've seen time and time again where you got guys like John Shire or, or Nolan Smith shooting three and four feet beyond the college three, which ultimately will translate into the pro three. And and the shooters understand it's a progression. They use their legs. You can see if they're coming and and they're slightly bent so they can get some drive and get up there. And and as I said, the shooters will adjust. It's the guys who were kind of on the the bubble, so to speak, as far as being good three-point shooters in college that ultimately struggle from beyond the arc in the pros. Well, I hesitate to get in this conversation because I I couldn't shoot a lick. But but you're right, though, and we talked about this. If I, you know, a guy is not a good shooter it really is going to show in a drill like this because if you can't shoot you will see that you know like Anderson you see him here shooting the ball right now in an active player he's got to prove that as he goes further out how well he can shoot that ball and, and it's interesting there just isn't a lot of great shooters in this draft Andy Routes a good shooter I think Xavier Henry uh, is that's one proven skill that, that he has but you look at this list there's question marks about a lot of these other guys about shooters Jordan Crawford does have that unlimited range you saw that in the NCAA tournament but he's streaky uh, yeah. from three and it's interesting you move to some of the small forwards and some of the bigs they're actually better shooters than some of the two guards I mean you're gonna be shocked when you see tiny gallon uh, out here later today that guy can shoot from NBA three range but he's a 300 pounder it's just an interesting mix a collecting mix of players talking about Henry from Kansas now obviously a, a very solid basketball player played one year for the Jayhawks now as far as the uh, I don't want to say negative but the scouting reports on the downside is he one dimensional, or does he have to prove that he can do more than just a stroke? It? Uh, you know, I think the other thing I got to point out about Xavier Henry was he was on a loaded team, yeah. As well, and he's a freshman, and he's a, a, they're they're a we're the number one team in the nation for much of the year. Coach is going to ask you to play a certain role on that team as well. Now, if he was on a really bad college team where he was asked to do everything, we may have seen him do more things on the floor. Yeah, but you know, Chad, I always like to say though, a lot of times people say, well, he wasn't asked. If you can do it, the coach will have you do it. If you're that good, I mean, he's not going to hold you back. And that's one thing I, you know, you don't, you didn't see John Calipari telling you know, John Wall, hold back. I mean, that, and I, I hear your point, but I think guys, if you're good enough, you're going to shine and, and, and going to. Yeah, but when you got a senior like Sharon Collins on the floor right. who's going to have the ball in his hands, you know, all of the time, you're not going to ask Xavier Henry to be the guy creating when you have a guy, an All-American like Sharon Collins. But still, that can simulate an NBA team. I mean, you're not going to play with guys, and they're going to be guys who are going to have roles set in an NBA team as well, so you have to figure out what you can do, and if you want to show it, you got you have to go out and do it. You know, guys, Henry had 69-3, second to Collins on Kansas's team. He had the big games, 31 points, 27 points. His numbers did dip a little bit. Now, keep in mind, he's a, he was a rookie, a freshman. There's 82 games in the NBA season. I might be nitpicking here, but any chance the fatigue factor uh, set in when his numbers started to dip a little bit late in the season? Well, I think that's a realistic concern for any rookie. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, particularly if you log in a lot of minutes. But I also think that people made the adjustment in the Big 12 with Xavier Henry. Nobody knew about him, and he got off early and played with a lot of confidence. Then the team started the game plan for him, and maybe that was uh, accounting for, for the dip. But the bottom line is, 
we just talked about it. Sharon Collins playing the point, penetrating, kicking. That really demonstrated the strength of Xavier Henry to be able to spot up and knock down threes. And I guarantee you that on any NBA team, there's room for a shooter. I was talking to uh, Jay Williams uh, here before the uh, game, or before the uh, combine opened up, and uh, ran into uh, Manny Harris of Michigan. And I said, boy, he's bigger than I thought he was. I mean, what, where does he stand as far as the draft boards right now? Well, you know, he's a, he's a second-round pick right now. I mean, he certainly can score. I think he's intrigued uh, scouts. I mean, this is a guy who's really been on the radar for three years. But, you know, there's a couple of things that concern you. One, Michigan never really got going. He never really was a winner um, out there. Two, shot selection for Manny Harris, right? He shot a poor percentage from the field, not necessarily because he can't shoot, but because he took a lot of difficult shots um, at Michigan State. But he's athletic, he's quick, he's got a long wingspan, he can play a little bit, bit of point. He more man uh, Jamal Crawford. Well, I saw him, saw him early in the season last year in the Old Spice Classic in Orlando, and Michigan was just getting out of the blocks. They were playing well, they were ranked. And suddenly, they took a turn for the worse, and Manny Harris was one of those guys that was asked probably to do more than he was capable of doing, and over the course of a season, it really had an impact. But if he shows the skills, remember, that's what coaches are for. <laughs> you know, Michigan made the tournament two years ago, and then you mentioned they were playing well earlier, Len, and they went south. Was Manny Harris ever on the uh, first round talk or on the bubble at all in the first round? I think he's always been right there in the bubble because the talent's there. Yeah. I don't think anybody questions the talent. It's just about the maturity, seeing him next level. But, you know, he, I, I think his game is a lot like you're talking about, like a Jamal Crawford, right? He's a he's a guy who can play a little point. We saw him. He had a couple of triple doubles this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's get, he can get the assist. He can handle the ball. But decision-making. You know, and the last thing also talking to John Beeline, he's coachable. And I've got a chance to do a couple of his games this year. And he always, after a game, says, what can I do better? You know, can we watch tape? Can you tell me how I can be a better NBA player for the future? Uh, so if a guy is coachable and he wants to be better, at least that mentality is something that can help. Welcome back to Chicago. That's Lance Stevenson of the Cincinnati Bearcats. He was born ready, right, Jay? I mean, <laughs> average 29 points a game in high school. Boy, a ton of hype. Now, he is on uh, Chad Ford's uh, list of uh, most improved players as we head for the draft. Uh, must impress list, actually, but uh, I was going to say that you saw him work out in Las Vegas, and you were impressed with him. Oh, what? yeah, I mean, he's an NBA player all the way. He's got the body. He's got. He's very skilled. He's got a mid-range game. He can handle the basketball. Not a great three-point shooter, but the thing about him, even from his high school days, has been what kind of kid is he? Uh, you know, what is he coachable? And, you know, one of the things about him, and I even saw this in Vegas a little bit, is the, is the bad body language. And I was going to ask, you know, Billy, ha what kind of difference does that make? You're a GM, you're watching these guys, when you see guys with body language that may suggest that he's not the greatest kid or that he may be difficult to coach. Well, a lot of times, Jim, you got to caution yourself because you may look at a guy in body language and want to rule him out because you don't like his attitude. But until you get him in a room and start talking to him and ask him the questions, you may find that just who his personality, who he is, and so you say that's who he is as a kid. But also you do background checks and you try to figure out what type of kid he is. You do the background checks, you talk to his coaches, you talk to his teammates, figure out he's not a bad kid, he just looks that way. Well, I mean, no one wants to label anybody a bad kid, but, you know, it's no secret that he's had off-the-court problems. He's been in court and had some adjudication to some of his actions, so a background check is going to reveal that. Plus, talking to two scouts here today, talked about interviews with him, and one of the things that stuck out with them when they asked, you know, why are you coming out after your first year, he pretty much said, I hate school. So I'm wondering, seriously, how, how do you take that in consideration as a GM? Not that it should have any impact on what he does, because I agree, he's a tremendous talent. But when you combine the two, you know, does it put him in positive territory if he shows real well at this camp and in Las Vegas? Or if you look at his background and, and, and you talk about some of the issues he's had, does it put him in negative territory? Well, there, there are some guys that, that you know, like uh, Amari Stoudemire, there was a lot of back he's coming out, and that's why he slipped. And I think he's been drafted and end up being a pretty good player and I think sometimes you get that baggage and you got to figure out all right what was it what was the reason why did it happen so that's where it's more of not just getting the background but also talking and finding out exactly what the fact that they didn't want to go to school Bobby Knight has always said college is not meant for everybody if they didn't have the rule where you couldn't go pro he probably would have wouldn't have went to college in the first place and you know one thing to say about him I, I spent some time talking to him in Vegas afterwards you know here's a guy very hyped you get a lot of people around you telling you you're the greatest, telling you you've already made it. And, and these are young kids. They're impressionable yeah. kids. They're immature. They're going to buy into some yeah. of that. And he was very quick to admit to me that he bought into the hype. 
He started to believe what people were telling him. And he had a humbling year, though. You had teams pull out of recruiting him. You had teams that were worried about, you know, he was trashed uh, a lot in the media. And, you know, he didn't have the dominating year that I think that he thought he could have at Cincinnati. And he said it was a humbling experience. And I, I think we have to remember these are young kids and people can't mature. I wouldn't want to be judged by every decision I made when I was 17 years old. But I'd rather see him mature in college. No one can tell me oh, yeah, that no. Lance Stevenson is not a better player today, even for the one year in college, than he was coming out of high school. No, and maybe another year or two, he might be the, fulfill the potential that, that's been asked of him. I, I think his game translates more to the NBA than it did in college. So the fact he has more of an ISO kind of a game where he can post you up, he can create mismatch issues. I, I think the problem for Lance Stevenson this year was the first year he was actually challenged. He was challenged as a man for Mick Cronin. I mean, nothing was going to go the way he expected it to go. It wasn't going to be you just come in and do your thing. He was going to be challenged every single day, and he, he dealt with that, that adversity. Um, but I, I do think he's going to be a heck of an NBA basketball player because of those attributes. Well, let's check in uh, momentarily, or let's check in right now with uh, Andy Katz. Andy? Well, thank you, Mike. I'm joined by John Nienagel, who is uh, known as the Brain Doctor. And we're talking and having a conversation over there about body language and how you read it, especially for all these GMs and player personnel directors. From your perspective, what are you trying to read about the way these players are handling themselves? Well, I look at more than just body language. Uh, my research shows that people have inborn designs, and so it's the greatest thing that makes them do what they do. So it affects their motor skills and their mind. So, yeah, I watch how guys move, whether they're more smooth which is more right brain dominance. If they're more robotic and mechanical, it's more of the left brain. The reason that's important is not only when it's a big game and tight, you know, when guys are loose, also it affects your vision. The right brain dominant guys have better peripheral awareness. They can see the floor better, wider. The, the left brain people have more of a tunnel vision, so if pressure really hits, they don't see the floor too well. And also just in, in terms of like, uh, you know, their, just their attitudes as well, uh, when guys tend to, out after something. I mean, when's the last time you saw Michael Jordan ever look like he was disgusted with anything except a, a, a teammate or somebody else, not himself, same as Larry Bird. So you really look for that mental toughness in every little movement and uh, everything that goes wrong with what they're doing out there. For those that can balance a lot of things at once, I think you once called me out on this. <laughs> what kind of, what side of the brain is that? Well, it's actually the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is a parallel processor and it's multitasking. So it doesn't mind a lot of things going on at once. And as I said before, too, it also sees much better peripherally. So you really want to, you know, to be a, a great quarterback or a point guard or even any kind of ball player to see the whole floor instead of one little specific area. And again, like the left brain dominant people will tend to be so much more singularly focused and they can't really walk and chew gum much beyond that at the same time. Well, Jay, I don't know, Jay, I don't know if John ever analyzed your brain, but... Uh... I'm sure it was um, a player that could do a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> kind of just like you, Randy. <laughs> Quick note, I know, Chad, you want to follow up on this, but you look at someone like uh, Stevenson here now. It's not five on five. So what can he do here at the Combine that could really improve his stock? Just attitude and work hard? Yeah, or? I actually think it's it's good. By, we talked about it. You give, show good body language, hustle, play hard. Um, you know, they, they don't want to see an attitude out here. Speaking of the uh, shooting guards of the twos here, how about uh, Sylvan Landisberg, 6'6", 202, sophomore season, he's coming out. Is he a classic example of somebody that might slip out of the first round, but if he came back to school or went back to school, he could work himself into a, being a first-round pick someday? I don't think he had a choice. He, he was uh, let go from that team. And so, you know, here's a, here's a kid who... I don't really think at this point you can you can transfer. Then you have to sit out a year, or you or you come you come into the draft. I think he felt at that point you better go now. Uh, uh, but also Tony Bennett's defense, the coach of, of University of Virginia, he did dismiss him, but he also left it open that he could come back. This was about I think uh, at, at least the indications was about attending class. Now that tells me that Sylvan Landisberg had no uh, no idea about uh, coming back to school that this was his year and i don't know who's around him and forming him but this is a guy who with another year or so had an opportunity once again in a tough acc to be among the leading scorers had a terrific mid-range game and still does and that really translates well in this league for his size at 6'6 a shooting guard not everybody has to be a three-point shooter 
You know, you can get shots and get easy shots and get to the free throw line as he did in the ACC. But I think it's just a year too soon. And going in the second round, late in the second round, which I think he may wind up being, you know, really is a peg down for him considering the potential that he had coming into Virginia. Yeah, and, you know, one thing, it, it, fortunate for these guys like Lance Bray, if he does get drafted in the second round by a team that he's not going to play, there is a developmental league that he can go and get better. And that's something that's a benefit for these guys. But you're right, Len, I wish a lot of these guys would stay in school a little bit Absolutely. longer and develop their games because once you get to the pro level, coaches don't have, and they're going to work with you. They're going to they have development coaches work with you. But their job is to win and win now. So they're going to work with the eight or nine guys that they feel they can best help them win and keep their jobs because you see there are a lot of jobs that get the coaches get fired every year. Seven, two oh five. Your thoughts on this young man? Well, he's on my list as guys that need to impress could crack the first round. I mean, the thing I like about him one, he's found a way to score. It reminds me a little bit of Jalen Rose with his ability to put the ball down the ground. He can get to the rim a little bit more explosive than Jalen was towards the latter part of his career. But an attribute that I saw that was very impressive impressive about Darrington is. Before this whole thing started, I walked over to him and said, you know, I've been watching you all year, so I wish you the best of luck. And he's like, I'm going to be the best here today, Jay. I'm going to be the best here today. So that little mental difference right there is something I think that can take him over to the next level as far as being a, a competitor and somebody who wants to be the best at what he does. And he, he knew you'd say that if you tell. That's why. Uh, it was smart. No, smart is beyond. You know, it's, it's interesting. He, he fits the, the, the model of a lot of guys in this draft. And you talk from NBA team to NBA team, they're all over the place on him. There's actually about 20 guys in this draft. Some guys have Hobson in the mid in the mid first round. Other guys have him in the mid second round. That it's a huge range for a guy like him. A lot of it just depends on what type of player you like. But a lot of guys are interested in his ball handling skills. The fact that he can play a little point or maybe be a point forward uh, in the pros. They saw a little Penny Hardaway in him, uh, actually. But other guys, eh, they don't see it. But interesting how you can have guys who are professional scouts and they can look at a guy and some people say, oh, this guy's going to be great in the NBA. And the other guy will say, absolutely not. Uh, usually there's a consensus on some guys. No consensus on Hobson. Yeah, but when it comes to the first round, all it takes is one person yeah. to like. That's right. That's, That's right. One job. And, and there are a lot of times if you're a team and you have your players ranking your board in draft night and you're hoping somebody, if, you've got, if you're number nine, and you always, it always a variable. There's eight players you like. There's not nine. Of and so you always look for somebody to take one guy in front so you can get your guy. And you know, one year we took Iguodala. Rafael Adarujo was that guy that Toronto took in front of us to allow us to get Andre Iguodala. Hey, Chad, I'm glad you brought up the three positions because the scouting report says he is capable of playing three. Does that always translate from college to the NBA? Not always. I mean, in, in my mind, again, it really depends on what the rest of the system is about what your teammates are about and what a coach is looking for and guys sometimes develop into that i remember you know in the advent of the point forward i'm not sure paul pressy with the milwaukee bucks really ever thought that he'd be bringing the ball up the floor but don nelson as creative as he was you know he de de devised that simply because too many teams were pressing his point guards and he wanted to get people out of the way get his offense started quickly and he figured at that position the small fours weren't guarding guys in line to end line but if you watch a lot of the, like you watch the Lakers play, Kobe really is the point guard. He brings yeah. the ball up a lot of court. Cleveland Brown, I mean Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James brings the ball to the point guard. So a lot of times if you get bigger guys that can play a lot of those positions, they can handle the ball. I think that's why teams love Evan Turner so much. They see him a ability to do that. Um, and that's, uh, it's a big plus when you can fit a guy in multiple positions. You look at Evan Turner, he says he fits with almost any team because you can play him with a multiple number of players, right? Some of the findings, uh, as far as Jordan Crawford's is concerned, people say he's not that athletic. I what? beg to differ. I've what? seen him get elbows over the rim. Yeah, and, and again, his elevation on his jump shot, if he's knocking it down, he moves well without the ball. The question is, is he consistent? And what I believe consistency is about repetition. And if he gets with the right team and the right coach, this is a guy that's going to be able to put points on the board. But he needs to impress them and show that he has the foundations here. And I think he can crack into the first round. You know, I think he matured a lot over the season. I did a couple of their games at the beginning of the season. And Chris Mack said one of the biggest challenges for him would be his ability to be an efficient scorer. Somebody who's not going to shoot upon volume, but is going to take the correct shots within the offense. And I think towards the latter part of the year, he finally started to pick it out he does have the athletic ability uh, my question for him is his mental discipline and toughness to really defend i think at times he's become a little lazy he wants to leak out get some easy points in transition 
But I think he could be a heck of a defender if he really applies himself defensively. If he can compete, uh, have that complete. I think it's a chance to be a special player. I think people talk about coachability with him all the time. Is is he a kid who's going to be coached? Um, you know, Don McLean was working out with him in L.A., and it, that was the first thing he said about Jordan Crawford. He's been such a good basketball player his whole life. He's felt like, I can do this. Now to get to the next level, you got to start taking some coaching. You need to start to improve aspects of your game. You can't just be the best player in the gym anymore. He hopes that he can convince teams he's a Ben Gordon-type player, a guy who can come off the bench, be instant offense, can shoot the ball from long distance. That's what he wants to be. I'm not sure he's there yet. But he made great strides under Chris Mack. Yes, he did. Funny how that happens. The more you play, the better you get. <laughs> Going three times. Going three times. You don't make my 15 seconds. We're going again. Right there and go. Your former teammate there, Lynn. I was going to say, <laughs> he was a point guard. You know, he was our leader on the floor. But we wouldn't allow him to be that far. <laughs> hey, Jordan Crawford uh, talking about his uh, ability to score. He's 6'4. If he's 6'6, six, six, are we talking lottery pick maybe? Probably. Yeah. I mean, that shows you the difference just a few inches made. Hey, this is something interesting. I, mean, I haven't seen this. They're running the full sprints here. And this, you're going to find out what guys are competing at the end of the workout here. You know, a lot of guys probably didn't expect to be running sprints here at the end. And they got to make it in 15 seconds. You know what? I look at this thing. If I were a player coming into this and they said, okay, you have to finish this in 15 seconds, I would not be worried about 15 seconds. I would just be worried about trying to finish first every yeah. single well, time. I was, hard. I was just noticing out there the guys are running. And you can see the guys are competing. And then there are guys who are just Josh, trying to make it in under the 15 seconds. They see and they look up at the clock. They have enough time to kind of post in. You know, also, I think that really sets the bar mentally for other players. If you're a guy who comes in, you go through the workouts hard, you compete in every single drill, and then towards the latter part of the workout, you're still finishing first. I'm just kind of saying the placement in your head, okay, I'm better than you. You're always going to be second in my rear view. And look at the guys coasting right at the end, trotting to the line, just under the gun. And this, this also talks about preparation. Some of these guys, the minute they declare for the draft, are in there with trainers. They're working out every day. Other guys are goofing around. They're not prepared for this. And you're going to show. And you know, this is a big job addition. Why wouldn't you be immediately in the gym the minute you declare for the draft, getting in the best possible shape? You that could was be the in. most amazing thing. Is I find guys that would come in and they'd be out of shape. They, you know, you thinking this is your your livelihood. This is like you know a month that you got to work out and be in shape. What else you got to do? I mean, without exception, or maybe with a few exceptions. If I'm going to give you, a, as a general manager or an owner, I'm going to give you millions and millions of dollars to play for me, and you're still not in shape with that opportunity, what's going to happen when I give you that money yeah. and a guarantee? You know, I don't mean to be the master of the obvious here, but we opened up this show with uh, these guys trying to fulfill a dream of playing in the NBA. The word coasting, it blows my mind that coasting would even be mentioned here, that guys would even think about that. Well, because some guys, I mean, you need to get the brain doctor to tell you why some guys would do that. You know, we need to bring them over and get them back in. Because some guys, you, it's just amazing. Jordan, what did you think you got out of this first workout in front of all these power brokers in the NBA? Uh, I think I showed them I could shoot on a consistent basis. You know, somebody drive and kick, kick it to me, I can knock down open shots. So that was the main thing. Now, this is just one part of the process. You've got the basketball, you've got the interviews, and the medical testing, and then it's the workouts with the teams. Yeah. What do you think of the process that you're going to have to go through here? Uh, I think the, 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 the main process is the interview. Back-to-back -back interviews every day, you know, asking, you know, grilling you, you know, wanting to know everything about you. So, to, you know, just interviews is the main thing with me. I think I can show a lot of people I can play the game. So the interview with the As an underclassman, this is the first year that uh, underclassmen couldn't come here to test. They had to make the decision on May 8th. You made that decision early. What would have changed if the old rule was in existence? I think it would have made it easier for a lot of other players that really didn't get the test, didn't get, didn't get to go to the workouts because of the exams and things. So I think that made it tough on certain players that really wanted to test. You know, I was strong about coming out the whole time, so it made it a little easier on me. Well, good luck the rest of the week. Thank you. Let's go back to you, Mike. All right, Andy, thanks a lot. As we take a look at the threes or the small forwards, uh, some pretty good names here. Now, Chad Ford, his mock draft. Now, I will preface this by saying that it will change over the next few weeks. The draft is coming up on the 24th, but seven of these players were in your uh, most recent yeah. mock draft is going as first-round picks. And, and two of them aren't here. Al Farouk Aminu is not here, and Wesley Johnson. Those guys are uh, top-ten picks. 
their agents have decided to withhold them from this this event. But there's a lot of talent here in the small forward. You talked about this is a weak point guard draft. I think it's not a strong shooting guard draft. But if you get to the forwards, there's a lot of talent. And there's a lot of guys that really are I intriguing here, whether it's a Gordon Hayward, who a lot of teams are interested in, or, uh, you know, a Luke Babbitt is a guy that a lot of teams like, Damian James, uh, Stanley Robinson, a lot of talent here. You mentioned Stanley Robinson. Uh, we opened up the show, and you guys said there is some room for butterflies uh, because nerves will take over some of these players, and they settle down. I thought it was interesting reading ESPN.com last week that you had a, an episode uh, with Stanley Robinson over nerves. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I walked into the gym, and uh, these guys knew I'm coming in, and, and Stanley Robinson goes out, and he's shooting air balls. And when I'm talking about air balls, I'm talking missing three, four, five feet. And uh, he's, he's, he's jittery. It goes on for the whole workout. Now, I've watched Stanley Robinson for years in Connecticut. I know that's not him. But it, it was a very disappointing workout. His trainer came up afterwards, said he was extremely nervous when he walked in the gym. But what was so interesting to me is the next day when I walked in the gym, Stanley Robinson was waiting for me. And when I, when I talked to Stanley, he immediately stuck out his hand, introduced himself, said, listen, I want to apologize for my performance yesterday. I was nervous. I wanted to come out and impress you. And obviously, you saw what happened. But it was, it was really interesting to talk to him because, you know, here's a kid who quit for UConn for a while. You know, and there was questions about who is this kid, what is his motivation. Worked in a steel yard for a while before Jim Calhoun came back and convinced him to come back onto UConn. He's a great kid. I talked to him for about 30 minutes. And it was interesting because that night was the night LeBron James had that terrible Game 5 performance for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I asked him, did you watch the game? He said, yeah, I watched. I said, how did LeBron play? He said, oh, he was terrible. You know what? If LeBron James can have a bad game, you can have a bad day working out in the gym. It's not everything doesn't rest on one day. He came out the, the second day, had an awesome, awesome performance. He's super athletic. Uh, he may be the best athlete in this draft. Yeah. Um, and he's not very skilled, and he's going to have some things to work on. But I think we have to understand the human element with these kids. These are not robots. They cannot come out and perform at the highest level at every single moment. These are human beings, and you got to give them a little slap. Andy Katz uh, standing by with James Anderson of Oklahoma State. Andy? Thanks, Mike. James Anderson here. You know, in the uh, consensus poll that I did of uh, third of the league, you were a lottery pick. So with being a lottery pick, not all the lottery picks have decided to come here and participate in the basketball portion. Why did you? Uh, just because of the competition and uh, just coming out and going up against the competition, doing the different drills and just showing everybody uh, something that I, that, that's not my density during the regular season. So. What do you need to prove in the other parts, especially the interviews, to secure yourself a lottery select? Uh, just be confident going in the interviews and even on the court and just... Having a lot of confidence. You play with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. I remember last summer, we, some of us forgot to put you on those Naismith lists, and that's during the season. How much has that given you some sort of added energy that people some, sometimes forget about you? Uh, it's just a, I use it as a lot of motivation, and uh, that's something that I can just use to, to work harder and play harder. Well, good luck, James. All right, thank you. All right, back to you, Mike. All right, thanks a lot, Andy. Let's get back to... Uh, James Anderson, incidentally, according to Chad's mock draft, he's a first-rounder. Let's listen in now as uh, they explain jumper. this drill. Here we go. Get to the sideline now. Get to the sideline. Hey, Jay, you wanted to get back to Stanley Robinson Drive momentarily. It. Yeah, you know, I think one of the Give attributes it. that he uh, really possesses is he has an extra gear. Uh, I think at times he has the ability to go out and get the basketball, to get second-chance opportunities. He has shown the range and stepping back, something he's worked nice. on over the last couple of years, stepping out in a pick-and-roll uh, pick scenario or pick-and-pop. I think the question for him is I think at times he hasn't really shown that aggressive mentality consistently. I think if he can continue to do that and continue to play with that extra gear, I mean, Ben Wallace, guys, I'm not that I'm comparing him to Ben Wallace, but Ben Wallace possessed that extra gear where he went after every second chance opportunity. If Stanley Robinson can do that and really make his niche, I think he can find a way into the NBA and be there for a long time. Well, I want to go back to Andy's uh, interview with James Anderson. And, and to me, I applaud every guy who is uh, a lockdown lottery pick that comes here, recognizing that all you're doing is demonstrating skill. You're only confirming what people have already thought about you. For the guys who aren't here, you're not competing against anybody. You're competing against yourself. And, and it would give me pause when I don't care if it's the agent or the player, if you're not here 
to demonstrate that you've got the skills. Because that's what this is about. This is purely about skills. Yeah, we talked on the periphery about attitude and body language. If you've got something to hide, and I know they have the individual workouts with the teams, et cetera, but as a whole, show me you got the courage to come out here and demonstrate and help me confirm what I already thought. Well, you know, the one thing we about that, and I think you're absolutely right, but the problem you have here is these players get these agents. Oh, I know. And, 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 they, and, they, and they say, well, I'm 20 years old, 19. I'm supposed to listen to this guy as an advisor. And the agents are trying to protect themselves because they say, well, my guy isn't going. Why is your guy going? So so it becomes a game. And then we all. I've been yeah, in that game. Yeah, right? But, you but I, always, side. Always, I always encourage my guys to go. To go. At the time, it was in Orlando back in the early 90s. And all of my guys had to go. Simply because, again, you're just confirming what people already know about you. If you're going to be the best, you come out here and be with the best. Well, vice versa, a lot of those players might not have all those skills. So uh, you can't see that vice versa, opposite side for an agent. They might want to hide some of those yeah. players. That's some what I was saying. Exactly. It would give me pause now. Yeah. If, if, you, if you're buying a new car, they don't want you to test drive it. There's got to be something wrong Some with it. But, but, no one, but on, the, on the other end, no one has pause about John Wall not being no. Uh, or Evan Turner. I mean, it's not going to change your assessment that his agent told him not to be here. You know, we no, talk about not, Jordan. But, but there's a lot of other guys. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh -huh. Those are the two probably most dynamic players in the yeah. draft. We can give them a pass. But beyond that, I mean, there are questions about, you know, Aminu. There are questions about some of the other guys who didn't show up. Now, I mentioned the fact that uh, America was introduced to him during the NCAA tournament. You guys knew all about him. And no-brainer coming out? Um, I'm not so sure about that. Look. I mean, if Butler were, <clears throat> excuse me, if Butler were in one of the media centers, we'd know all about Gordon Hayward. But the fact that they played in the Horizon League where they dominated. His stock is as high yeah. as it's probably going to be. Yeah. And, and I don't even think we have a great gauge for that because I know teams are looking at him all the way up in the mid-lottery um, to the mid-first round. I mean, he's a guy I think people are still getting a handle on. I think people are going to be surprised he's a better athlete than people think he is. He did shoot well from three-point percentage his sophomore year, but the guy shot 44% from three his uh, freshman year. Clearly, he was the go-to guy. Defense is focused on him his second year. He won't be asked to do that in the NBA. He's not going to be asked to be the number one guy on a team. I think he's a better player than people are giving him credit yeah. for. And the last year, he might have given thought to coming out. Still a pretty good player his freshman year. But he stayed an extra year, got so much better, got a chance to be on the big stage, and I think that catapulted him into the forefront of, of most of the minds in the NBA. You know, Chad and Len, we've got a couple of Duke alums here. What were your thoughts Do on that really? last shot? <laughs> when Gordon Hayward took that last shot, especially when uh, CBS showed the end zone camera. I thought it was going in. Did you guys? Well, I was at the arena, so, I, yeah, it did look like it was going in, and I was just praying that it didn't go in because I didn't have to want to walk back to the hotel <laughs> and be that disappointed because it was such a great run. But to me, it was a great game, and um, I don't know how you felt, Jay. No, I thought it was an unbelievable game, and Gordon Haywood possesses all the skills of being a very special player. I think that champ that championship game was as much used to knock on it and say, you know, we don't have the powerhouses like a Kentucky or a Kansas. I thought it was a culmination of two teams that played within themselves. They played team basketball. Right. It wasn't one singular guy, one single guy who was taking over a game. It was a team combined. That's what I told your coach, your former coach, Mike Krzyzewski, in congratulating him. It was a triumph of the team concept. There were no absolute superstars there. Guys played together. It was a joy to watch. Even though it was played in the high 50s, uh, you know, early 60s, the bottom line was they played excellent defense and they executed when they could. You know, we're back to Gordon Hayward. The one thing that for me is going to be interesting because I see two teams, Utah at number 9 and Indiana at number 10. Utah, you know, they have Cal Corp as a free agent, so do they need to replace him or a guy like that? And then Indiana played at Butler. You know, Dunleavy's one going to his last year's contract. I think those are two teams that he's a perfect fit for him. So it would be interesting if Indiana would pass on him a la they did Steve Alford when they took Reggie Miller. Well, well, Bill, Billy, I, I was going to ask you as a GM, when you have a hometown product, you know there's a lot of pressure in the media to draft the guy who's the hometown kid. I think it's going to be insane for Indiana <laughs> because of who Hayward is and, and what, what he means to folks. But how much does that factor in when, you, when you're deciding between guys and there's a guy who can sell some tickets who are going to excite the fan base, but maybe there's a guy who plays who's a little bit better? 
Tell the truth, Billy. Tell the truth. <laughs> well, no, I know when Philadelphia, you know, there was you know a lot of university, you know, five of them. And Jameer had a great year, and Jameer was there. And Jim O'Brien was the coach at the time. And Jim O'Brien goes, "Now we're not looking at him." And I'm like the GM. You can't say you can't say it publicly. We gotta right. you gotta <laughs> sell it. But at the time, he didn't fit. But I think. Honestly, you got to make the the best decision. And if you look at it in 1987, Donnie Walls had Steve Alford, Mr. Basketball, Mr. Indiana, everything in Indiana, and he chose Reggie Miller. And then if you, I was there when they chose Damon Bailey as a second round pick, and Damon got hurt, had surgery. The next year we draft Fred Holberg, Mr. Iowa from Iowa State, the new head coach the there mayor. now, and we had to cut Damon Bailey. Now. I know what Donnie Walsh and Larry Brown were going to do, but they said, no, no, the sisters, everybody's coming in. We're going to all go tell Damon he's cut. Speaking <laughs> of small forwards, guys, what about Paul George now? Fresno State, some Tracy McGrady, Wilson Chandler comparisons, 6'7". Very long and lean, uh, very athletic. Uh, he, he, he's a, he's a big-time sleeper because when you look at this kid, he's super smooth. He's very skilled. He can do just about everything on the floor. Well, you know, the one thing about it, too, and this goes in, like you said, hometown and the marketing what when you start drafting your fans they follow your your reports chat they read all this stuff they see what's on sports center about these guys and if a george is mentioned at five or you take him at five all the fans wait a minute Who's he that? wasn't in any mocks why is he up there so the, so that's when the fans sometimes start booing until they see what the guy type of player he is so that's where a lot of times the fans they get caught up in your mock i think you were you at 2.0 now or yeah, yeah i'm at 2.0 <laughs> he's at 15 right now which a lot of people would say is high but you know, mock drafts right now are a little bit of a joke, right? Because I'm trying to te trying to decide what a team's going to do. And you know this, Billy. You don't know what you're going to do at this point. Other than Washington Wizards, teams don't necessarily know what they're going to do right now. Ask me on draft night. It'll be a lot more accurate. Well, what happens, it goes in stages. Not to go too It goes in stages. It starts at the lottery. So now everybody knows the order. Then it starts here where you start trying to talk to move up. Minnesota has five picks in this draft. I think they have three in the first round. Are they going to take them all? People, will they try to move all those picks up? And as you start getting further in the draft, people will start trying to move picks, and then they start, they'll start lying, saying, no, no, we don't like that guy. And then you try to see which, where do guys go? Do they go back for a second interview? And the agents say, well, I know Philly really likes this guy. Well, the threes are the small forwards uh, on the floor right now. That's Damian James of Texas. He averaged 18 points to 10 rebounds. Second year in a row, he's averaged a double-double. Uh, he was in this uh, camp or combine last year, as was Luke Heron Gody, Donnie Lawal, Rivas Vasquez. But getting back to uh, Damian James, uh, Chad, he had an unimpressive uh, combine here last year. But again, back-to-back -back years, double-double guy. And you said during the workouts, he's been attacking everything. Well, he's not a skills guy, right? So in, a, in, a, in an environment like this, he's not going to show as well as some of these other guys. He's not going to look like Paul George. He's actually been working out with Paul George in L.A. Yeah, he certainly yeah. helped himself by getting the information last year, you know, absorbing it and going back. A lot of guys, their egos, you know, get hurt, and they want to continue to try to prove people wrong. But I agree with you, Chad. He is a power forward in a small forward's body. He's just grouped with the small forwards. He's the kind of guy that if you like him and he improves certain skills, which I'm sure he will with time, you just want him on the floor. He's a basketball player. You don't want to characterize him in one position or another. You know, I, I think he has improved tremendously from last year. I remember two and a half years ago, I was in Houston with John Lucas and we were watching him work out. And it was the first time he was actually moving away from the basket, moving away from being a power forward, trying to put the ball down on the ground, make decisions off the dribble, work on his perimeter jump shot. And I think at times, last year, we saw him trying to be so much of a guard that he lost some of his down low attributes, some of the things he was really good at. I think this year was the first year I saw him mix it up. If he had a smaller guy on him, he would take him to the post. If he had a bigger guy on him, he could take him on the, on the outside on the perimeter, utilize that dribble. I still think he is raw as far as some skills, but I think he has a huge upside. And the kid has a demeanor of being somebody who wants to dominate every every possession. That's why you want him on the floor. You got to get him in the game. And, and you know, you compare him to, I just want to note, a guy that we didn't know who's not here, and that's Washington's Quincy Pondexter. Another senior had a big year. He, he actually declined an invitation to the camp. I was just talking to Andy Katz at the break, who talked to uh, uh, Romo, who said that he decided not to come here and show up. You know, I, I don't understand that. I don't either. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, you know, here's, all. here's a guy who, who did have a good senior season. Quincy Pondexter's improved. But how do you not come out here and compete and show that I'm better than a Damian James or a Stanley Robinson? I mean, these guys here are his competition well, Lorenzo, in the first round, and he's not here. Lorenzo Romar has a great grasp of the game. He's obviously an outstanding coach, but 
I don't know, maybe he's listening to some of these folks out there trying to play some gamesmanship. This is not the time for gamesmanship. You know, when you're outside of the first round, you want to do everything you can to get on that radar screen. And guys, who are you really competing against? I mean, you might go right. a one on one drill yeah. on a closeout <laughs> drill. The only person you're really competing against is yourself yep. throughout drills. So I don't understand why a guy like that, who has so much to prove and so much upside, why you wouldn't take every given opportunity that you have to increase your draft size. Because I understood in the past when it was the five on five, you, you feared injury. You know, you know where guys would, but this, I mean, you're shooting, you're doing footwork, you're getting taught. And, and so you're, you're, you're competing against yourself. So to me, it's foolish not to even come. I mean, I would love it for a Kevin, I mean, a John Wall to say, you know what, I'm coming just because I know I'm number one. I'm going to come to work out because I like basketball. But I, I fear in this case, this might be out of sight, out of mind for Quincy Pondex. Yeah, I, I, he was for me. I didn't even notice he wasn't on the list. And I, that's a problem. <laughs> if I don't notice it, that's a problem. <laughs> We're at the 2010 NBA Draft Combine in Chicago, Illinois, at the Attack Athletics Training Center. Mike Gleason, along with Jay Williams, a two-time National Player of the Year, the second overall pick in the 2002 draft. Uh, Billy King, a captain of that 1988 Duke team, went to the Final Four, the uh, former president, general manager of the Philadelphia 76ers. Len Elmore was a first-round pick in the NBA and ABA draft when he came out of Maryland. Chad Ford from ESPN.com. And Andy Katz is here as well in Chicago, and he's standing by right now at Lance Stevenson of the Cincinnati Bearcats. Of Cincinnati and Lance, I think there was a time sort of right after the season where people weren't sure if you were going to stay in the draft. How did that decision go down? Uh, it was a family decision. I felt like I was ready and uh, I, uh, mentally and focused, and uh, I think I was ready, so that's why I made that decision. So what do you need to get out of this process where you're going against some other guys, but maybe not as intense when you go for a team workout? Uh, I just work hard, try to get better every time, just impress the GMs, and just, uh, uh, just working hard and trying to get better every day. What do you need to sell them on when you do the interviews in front of all these player personnel directors and GMs? That I'm a, I'm a, I'm a great kid and uh, I'm focused and I'm mentally ready. How ready are you to have an impact in the NBA, not just a draft pick? I'm ready. Uh, I think I'm going to be a good impact and uh, I'm just going to keep working hard. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Let's go back to you, Mike. All right, Andy, thanks a lot. Here's some notable one-and-dones. Uh, Lance Stevenson, of course, uh, trying to become a one-and-done, leaving Cincinnati to enter the NBA draft. And Eric Bledsoe of Kentucky, and, well, I guess, uh, Chad, you have all those Kentucky, <laughs> Kentucky guys going in the yeah. first round, huh? Hey, man, they, they could all theoretically go in the lottery. Uh, that's, uh, that's how stacked that Kentucky team was this year. Here's an interesting guy, Lazar Hayward out of Marquette. Played out of position. I know you said, Jay, that a lot of guys play out of position, but this guy's been productive for four years at Marquette. Uh, of course, they had the big three going out last year, and Wes Matthews is the only one, ironically, to play in the NBA. But Hayward, he's at the camp. He's not listed on the ESPN.com Top 100. But uh, he was all Big East, at least all Big East uh, all tournament. He averaged, we had 23-9 and nine in the All-Star game at the Final Four. This guy... He's a good basketball player. Well, he certainly is. And again, when he came to Marquette under Tom Crean, he was a role player uh, behind the big three. You know, I got a chance to talk to Buzz Williams a lot throughout the entire year, and Buzz says that Lazar was his most dominant mentally player he had on his team as far as really playing hard every single possession. And I think he was able to score a lot of those points because he was mismatched. He was going against a four and a five. I think the question for him, will he be able to put the ball down on the ground and really play that, that two position and guard it, have the lateral quickness to guard it as well? Well, right there, you saw him put it on the floor, one dribble, two dribbles. Basically, in an offense, that's what you want to do and get that mid-range jump shot. And during that sequence, he didn't miss. Yeah, but then putting the ball down on the floor with nobody on you is completely different than putting the ball down on the floor with somebody pressing you on defense. Well, well, I've seen him. I've seen him put it on the floor with people on him. He does the same thing. The guy had outstanding field goal shooting. Yeah, I, talked, uh, I talked to some guys uh, last night because he's not been a guy that a lot of scouts have mentioned throughout the year. You're right, he's not in our top 100. I'm like, what's up with that? Uh, I think you can thank Wes, Wesley Matthews for that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, he should write a check to Wesley Matthews because, you know, teams look now and say, here's a guy in the same system. We missed him last year. Clearly, he was a round pick based off of how he played at Utah this year, and he wasn't even here at the top Billy, you look at Lazar Hayward. Uh, a few moments ago, we saw the graphic with one, uh, notable one and dones. Uh, he's a senior. How does that hurt him? Well, as we talk, a lot of times seniors, they tend to get overlooked because you're looking at potential. You're always looking for that freshman, that sophomore, and you're thinking, hey, you got room to grow. The 
four-year players from anything else, will they continue to grow? Are they 22, 23 years old? So they tend to not think they can overgrow. But I think sometimes the seniors are the ones that are more ready to come in and play right away because they've matured. They've gone through living away from home. They've gone through the practice. They've gone through the losses. Seniors, to me, are, are more prepared, ready to play. And that's why you see a lot of second-round seniors, second-round draft picks here, the ones not drafted, have a great impact in the NBA. And just watching that sequence again as we did the split screen there, the guy has tremendous form. You look at the rotation, you look at the follow through, you look at his elevation. That's really what it's all about. You know, you're going to get free in a, in a situation where you use judgment and defense is playing off you, one, two dribbles and pull up. You're not going to have a guy's hand in your face most of that time if the ball's moving correctly and the team's executing correctly. You got to knock down those shots, and I like that. And, and let's be honest, it's all about where he gets drafted. If he gets drafted into the right system, there's no doubt about it. He could be a guy that can come off the bench and knock down shot after shot after shot. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's in interesting because now his spot on the floor is replaced by a guy like Charles Garcia. Uh, you know, scouts feel like they know everything about Lazar. No one knows about Charles Garcia, right? He played one year at Seattle University, bounced around in junior college, got into lots of trouble, had all sorts of issues, then comes in and has a bunch of dominant games at the start of the season. He wasn't on any scouting list. Guys were booking flights to go see <laughs> Seattle U games. And then I think the hype cooled down a little bit. Uh, you know, he's, he started to struggle a little more as the season got on. People started to realize what he is. He is a skilled player. He can do a lot on the floor. Uh, but when you look at his age, you look at his background, uh, you know, he's a guy that they're going to be doing a lot of background work on because you just don't have the pedigree from high school on to have a good feel for who this kid is. President and general manager of the Washington Wizards, Ernie Grunfeld, you got the top pick on Tuesday night in the draft lottery. What does it mean to the franchise to get the number one pick? Well, obviously it's huge. We had a 10% chance of getting it, and a number came up, and uh, we're going in a different direction. Last year at midseason, we made a lot of trades, and uh, we went young, and we're in a rebuilding process, and what better way to start the rebuilding process than to get the number one pick? After all that was, you know, happened with Gilbert Arenas, it was obviously very public, ends up going to jail. How much did the franchise need something like this, something positive? Well, it was very, very important to us. We had a very difficult season last year. It was difficult for our fan base. It was difficult for the players, organization. And, and this will give the whole city and the whole franchise a big boost. What do you think it meant to the Poland family? I mean, after Abe passed away and to have Irene there and, and to have this kind of good fortune, I mean, the fortuitousness of that to occur. Well, that was great. Mrs. Poland represented us up on the dais, and she was wearing Mr. Poland's championship ring back from 78. And it was very moving, and it was an end of one era. They've owned the team now for 45 years, and our new owner, Ted Leonsis, was also there. So with Mrs. Poland, it was an end of an era for 45 years, and with Ted being there, it's the beginning of a new era. And now, what better way to begin a new era than with the number one pick? I know you can't say who you're going to pick, but how difficult a decision is it of who it could be at the number one? Well, it, it, it's a great decision for us to be able to make. We have choices, and obviously there's some outstanding players there at that spot, and uh, we're looking forward to making that pick. Thanks, Ernie. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Let's go back to you guys. Obviously, they cannot project it, but the consensus will be more than likely John Wall of Kentucky. Back to you guys. All right. Thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, there it is after the NBA lottery. The Washington Wizards moving up to that top spot, and everybody here on the panel feels that John Wall will be the pick. The Philadelphia 76ers going second. He has shown the ability to score the basketball from outside, more of a streaky shooter. Uh, as far as going forward, scouting report, uh, you wonder if he's uh, going to be a consistent outside threat, but I think there's all things he can work on to become better, but there's no doubt about it, him being one of the most dominated players in the guard position I've seen in a long time. Well, I will say this, you know, this is a league, as Billy mentioned, of trends, and Rajon Rondo is not necessarily <laughs> consistent outside True. shooter, but this guy is unbelievable. And when you look at John Wall, the thing I like about him, he is, has a penchant for making the big play. And, and that's, that's another thing that you can't discount. You know, he's the most dynamic guy in the draft. There's no question about it. And I think that Washington, whether they want to or not, they have to take him <laughs> yeah. because history is not very kind when you pass on a guy that ultimately becomes a Hall of Famer. What do you think happens to Gilbert Arenas now? Does he stay? Does he go? Well, I think they got to bring him back because right now there's no trade value for him. So you bring him back, I think you put these, both these guys in the backcourt, yeah. and I think you got a dynamic backcourt because either one can handle the ball. It's almost like Jay when he played with Chris Duan at Duke. Either one can handle either one can shoot the basketball. So I think put him back there and have an exciting backcourt. They've got some cap space, go out and build a team. I think 
that's a team that could turn it around real quick. Yeah, I, I think that what's happened to Gilbert Arenas off the court has probably given him a dose, a huge dose of humility. He's going to fit in the role. He's going to want to be wanted, want to regain the popularity. And I got a feeling he'll do whatever it takes for getting good graces and, and to be uh, a prominent member of that team. Let's check in with uh, Andy one more time. Well, thanks, Mike. On Tuesday, I spent the day with John Wall and Reseda and Beverly Hills, California, and we talked a lot about maturing and handling different situations in the NBA. And one thing that was interesting was, this is before the draft lottery was announced, he knew that he more than likely would be going to a team that would be rebuilding, that wouldn't be on a high as he was playing at Kentucky. And here's what he had to say. Well, you know, me as a leader and a point guard, I always want to win, you know. The main thing is in go there, you know, if you lose games, you can't get frustrated, you can't get down, you know. That's the key thing is being mentally prepared. So I got to go in there try to make my teammates better, listen to my coaching staff, and just try to win games for the team and the, and the organization. Because I'm a hard worker, you know, I'm going to listen to whatever everybody got to tell me. I'm going to listen to the coaching staff. I'm going to listen to the veterans. And, you know, I think the college experience helped me out a whole lot with Coach Calipari and the whole coaching staff. And just my experience of playing one year college basketball prepared me for the next level. And, and I can tell you after talking to John Calipari and Rod Strickland that uh, John Wall was a good listener throughout the course of the season in Kentucky and that their inner circle, it was Brian and Dwan Clifton, good friends of his, and with his agent Dan Fagan, I can tell you they were genuinely ecstatic when the Wizards got that top pick. Now, during the break, they thought New Jersey was going to get it, as everyone did, because they had the, the best chance. But when they sat back and thought about Washington, with everything that's happened with Gilbert Arenas, a chance for a fresh start near his home in Raleigh, a franchise that more than likely is going to start to pay some money to put some pieces around him. He really liked the situation, really a great fit for him going forward once they announce his name on June 24th as a new Washington Wizard. All right, thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, so you guys think it's a done deal? John Wall goes uh, to the Wizards. Do the Sixers take Evan Turner? Is that a done deal? I think it's a, it's a little bit more of an awkward fit. I think he is the number two pick in the draft, but, uh, you know, I think Philly could do a lot of different things there. One of the guys they're trying to move is Elton Brand. They could try to package that pick together, um, save some cap space. And I'll tell you one team, the Minnesota Timberwolves, who are sitting there at four, they love Evan Turner. They were very disappointed that they slipped from – what they thought would be the number two pick down to the number four pick. As Billy pointed out, they have five picks in this draft. I, I think they're going to be very aggressive about trying to go up two spots in the draft to get Evan Turner. Well, last year when they picked three point guards in the first <laughs> round, no, but that was collecting yeah. assets. Yeah. That's what they're doing, so they can wheel and they can deal. But in the end, I, I think, again, you got to go for the best available player. And I, and I think Philadelphia has to go with Evan Turner and, as you said, try to package some things that are going to be able to get them the other needs that they have. Yeah, I mean that's that's the big thing in this draft. You want to you want to not show your hand, but also you want to be listening to offers. And like you said, Minnesota wants to move up. See what they want to give you. I mean, last time the Sixers had the second pick in 1997 was my first year with Larry Brown. We took that pick and traded it, and was able to reshape the team. Let's get back to the court right now and talk about some of those small forwards out there. Luke Babbitt, uh, for instance, from Nevada, leaving after his sophomore season, 22 points, about nine rebounds a game. Thoughts on Luke? Yeah. I, it, I don't think there's anyone who's rising more in the draft right now than Luke Babbitt. I don't actually understand why. You know, during the season, you know, they had uh, teams had him rated as a late first rounder to early second rounder. Well, while the parity in college basketball was very evident, he didn't necessarily play against the top-notch competition on a consistent basis. So, you know, again, there's going to be some question marks as to really how his skill translates. Um, just as importantly, he cut his hair, so I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> and he's a lefty, so that, that makes it even more intriguing. Hey, guys, you know what's funny? I'll, every time I hear scouts talk about during this time of year, Kenny Guard, you know how many guys in the NBA that I know that cannot guard at all, <laughs> that still make a lot of money? I mean, he has the ability to be a guy because he's a lefty. He's a scorer. He can score. Hey, he's not going to be drafted to be a defensive stopper. Yeah, but, but usually, the, usually the guys that can't score are the guys that, I mean, can't defend are the guys that really can score a lot. That's true. If, I mean, if, if you're a, a decent scorer and you can't guard, you can't get on the floor. You know, I talked about Chad's uh, mock draft, and they had seven uh, small forwards going in the first round. Devin Ebanks from West Virginia was not exactly. one of them, so he fell out of the first round, at least uh, in your mind right now. Sorry, he's calling you out right now. Uh, he's calling you out. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a young guy. I got Bob Huggins as a coach. I think he should go back and get better and better and better. I think but Huggins is on the phone, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he's interesting because, obviously, he was a very highly uh, recruited player, um, one of the top high school players in the country. I, the thing that stood out for me was 
He struggled offensively. I don't think there was any question about that. Um, and then we thought about him, though he's going to be this long, athletic defender, but I think we're going to find out tomorrow he's not as long as people thought he was. It was a, a visual illusion. And he's not nearly as athletic as people thought he was. And then when you look at the some of the issues, he was suspended from the team, some of the other things that, that, that people are looking at, you, you'll, you'll take a gamble. Someone's going to take a gamble on DeMarcus Cousins, and regardless of some of the background issues, because he's such a big talent. With Ebanks, where there's more questions than teams, he's the type of kid who sometimes slides in the draft because teams will say, and I'm not sure if the talent is worth the risk. Yeah. And that, that's, he's a good player. I don't, don't get me wrong, but I, I think he's the type of kid who could slide. What well, they were saying was, if you're going to make a mistake, make it big. You know, so Cousins, you know, if you make a mistake there, at least he's big. Well, I, I think well, he has the talent. I, I question his mentality. Does he have that killer mentality? I think at times this year he, he's disappeared. But let's be honest, the leader of that team was Deshaun Butler. Deshaun made every big-time shot. I think at times Kevin Ebanks was nowhere to be found. And also, I mean, him only being around 215, he gets pushed around everywhere. He's kind of like a, a stick blown in the wind out. Well, Deshaun Butler's a senior, so he's gone. And I think Ebanks looked at that situation. But this is one of those cases. Sometimes you run towards something like the NBA and possibly be in the first round. And sometimes you run running away from something, which might be the program that you're in and how you're viewed in that program. I don't know. I think Ebanks is running away from something, and that's a mistake. I thought it was interesting. Larry Harrison, one of the assistant coaches for West Virginia, who were doing a game uh, last year, he said work, when Ebanks work, does work, what he does well, work, rebound work, both work, ends, mid-range jumper, work, he's a good player, but sometimes he tends to drift out and show people what he can't do. But that's always the case. I mean, a couple of years ago, I saw that in the, the two guys from Wake Forest and Jeff Teague and, and James Harrison, these guys um, tried to show people towards the end of the season what they thought they couldn't do, what people thought they couldn't do. They tried to show them, and, and these guys ultimately failed because they were doing things that they weren't strong at as opposed to playing to their strengths. Luke Babbitt of Nevada. Luke, you are skyrocketing up various draft boards. Jay Billis the other night on the lottery show had you at number nine in the best available players. Why don't people know enough about you? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, that's not something I can really control. Um, I just try to go out there and, uh, and play and help my team win and play in a smaller conference, and uh, so I guess that might be why. Why do you think you're ready to not just be a high lottery pick, but a player that teams can select and contribute next season? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, I've worked pretty hard uh, my entire game and feel like I'm uh, you know, as ready as anybody to come in and contribute uh, with uh, the way I've worked on my skill level and uh, shooting the ball and just all around the game, uh, I think I can help uh, any team. Now, I'm not comparing you to Chris Mullen, but I had one NBA player personnel guy tell me that, yeah, a little bit, a little bit like that, but that it's a Mullen-like game. I mean, who would you fashion yourself after? Um, I, I don't really have one player. I've heard the Chris Mullen. Um, I like I like watching guys like Paul Pierce, uh, Stephen Jackson, Rashard Lewis, those kind of guys that can uh, that can score and uh, similar similar heights to me and have a similar game. Well, good luck this week. Oh, thanks a lot. All right, Mike, Luke Babbitt from Nevada. Get used to this name, and I know Chad's got him high up as well. A player that could go somewhere high in the lottery. Andy, Chad also has uh, six of these players on this list uh, going in the first round in his first mock draft or the most recent mock draft, I should say. And again. Let me say that he says that will change over the weeks. But uh, there's some of the names of the fours uh, coming in. You see Derek Favors there out of Georgia Tech. Luke Herringote is back here for the uh, second year out of Notre Dame. Of course, Luke not projected as a uh, first-round pick. And uh, let's talk about a young man from England. Uh, he's 19 years of age, 6'11", 235 pounds, Ryan Richards. You know, uh, a lot of people won't know him, but what, what he got on the radar screen... Uh, and when Team USA plays the international team at the Nike Hoop Summit, they brought this kid in as a player who uh, was just going to practice with the team. He was 16 years old. The more they saw him in practice playing with guys, he actually got out on the floor and played and played well, and NBA teams have been really following him ever since. You know, he's not a dominant player yet internationally. He's an upside guy, uh, which a lot of these international players are. But he's an intriguing guy, and when you look at teams, they have multiple picks in the first round especially when you get late in the first round, they don't have the roster spots for these young players. So they draft a guy like that. They let an international team develop him for a few years. And then if they're ready, they bring him over. He fits that type of mold. 
Well, one of the things I think, and Billy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with international players, and when you see guys with potential and watching Richards out there, some of the inside drills, he's got the athleticism, he's got the explosiveness. You know, they don't have bad habits. They haven't developed bad habits. They've gone through a process where it's been more fundamentally sound. And so if you're going to start with somebody with potential, you want to start with somebody with a fundamental base. No, you're exactly right. And that's where most of the European players are taught the fundamentals. They really, you know, you were taught, I was taught growing up. Nowadays, a lot of guys will bypass a lot of fundamentals because they have so much skill work. And so they're so athletic and they can do a lot more things. But you get a European player, they're fundamentally sound. It's when they're in American basketball, that's where their bad habits come in for. I think Richards has nothing but upside. You know, for the fact, I think he just needs to understand how to get used to the physicality of the game over here in the States. I, I think the game is physical overseas to a certain degree, but when you come here and you're playing against guys who want to bang it down low every single time, he's so young being 19, there's a different aspect of the game he needs to understand, how to play in a game with two fouls, things of that sort. But I think he has a huge upside having big hands and soft hands around the basket. Well, I'll tell you what, it comes down to maybe having to taste your own blood a couple times, <laughs> get popped in the mouth before you start to realize what a guy has inside. And that's going to happen quickly. Here's a guy that was on the first round bubble last year, first round bubble this year, so nothing's really changed in that regard. Donnie LaWall out of Georgia Tech leaving Atlanta after his junior year. You know, it, it, it's, it's interesting with LaWall. He had a pretty good season, but he irritated a number of NBA scouts and GMs because he was on the floor with Derek Favors and he dominated the ball. And for the first half of the season, you didn't see uh, Derek Favors do a lot. And a, a lot of guys were frustrated. Actually, Georgia Tech changed gears midseason, got, got Derek Favors more involved, and they actually started winning some basketball games. You know, he's going to have some impact on the game. Lawal's a pretty good defender, excellent rebound in the top three or four in the ACC. Uh, I'm surprised that people haven't looked at him more. But the bottom line is I think he needs to work on his offensive game inside, particularly footwork, maybe being able to step away 10 feet from the basket, knock down the jumper consistently. But, but he's a pretty good player. He's one of those guys that I think has a chance also to crack, depending on what he does here, to crack that first round. Well, you know, one thing you saw that a 7-2 wingspan, that to me, you know, we were talking about it before. Yep. You don't rebound with your neck, rebound with your arms. And I mean, having that wingspan, I think he's somebody that has the motor, has the ability, and I always believe if you rebound it in college, you'll rebound in the pros. It always trains. Paul Millsap was a great rebounder in college. You know, he's a great rebounder. Kurt Thomas, great rebounder in college, great rebounder in the pros. You know, on top of his physical attributes, I think he has a, he kind of has a little mean streak to him, too. I mean, he plays with toughness. Uh, we got a chance to see that a couple of nights ago uh, when Matt Barnes, who, you know, plays for Orlando Magic, a very tough player, uh, there was a time where he helped up a player from the Celtics team. You just don't do that. You don't help up another player from another team. And there have been times this year where I've only seen Only on games, the pro level. Right? Only <laughs> <in> the, <laughs> there have been times I've seen a guy down on the ground uh, playing against Georgia Tech, and I've seen Ghani step over him. Kind of saying that that's where you belong. You belong on the ground. I put you on the ground. You belong there for a reason. So you like that in that the college? That kind of mentality, yet. I do. I like that kind of toughness because that's something that really translates over to the NBA game that guys need to bring to the table. So you say good motor. You say toughness. Say 15 double rebound games. So what can he do here? It's not five on five. What can he do here? I realize there's going to be workouts too. Well, but I, what can he do here to solidify himself? In the I first think round? again playing to his strengths. I mean, when they have drills at a full court, to be able to get out and run and demonstrate that he's got. Uh, fleetness and, and again footwork when they're running drills inside I mean you take a look at him right there on these drills coming out pivoting going to the basket hard catching getting his footwork together something that Derek Favors had trouble with early and that's why the wall had to be gone to but towards the end obviously Derek Favors the cream rises to the top we're at the 2010 NBA draft combine in Chicago along with Jay Williams, Billy King, Len Elmore, Chad Ford, I'm Mike Gleason, and uh, once again, the sixth member of our broadcast team, here's Andy Katz. Andy? Well, Gordon, obviously your decision was well documented. How close were you to deciding to go back to school versus stay in the draft? Uh, I mean, it was a very tough decision. Uh, one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make just because of the people at Butler and um, the whole atmosphere. It's, it was a family there. And, uh, so it was really tough to leave, um, but, but I think the opportunity was, was here to come to the NBA, and so it was a lifelong dream, decided to take it. How much would your decision, you think, change if the rule wasn't in existence that you had to decide by May 8th? Um, well, I mean, I, I think that, I don't know how that would change, because I would have probably come to this and um, based some of what I wanted to do off of this. So um, I don't know, I think, I think it's tough uh, that you got to decide so early. It was a really quick turnaround for me. 
uh, with going so far in the tournament, so it wasn't much time. And um, uh, I think I think it would have helped me a lot if, if I would have been able. To, the date would have been pushed back. In what way are you a better player now, a year later, after USA Basketball, after the year that you and your team had? Oh, I think I'm just a lot more confident. Um, confident in my abilities to, to play with these types of players. Um, I think just the experience of playing with the, these guys day in and day out has helped me a lot too. So um, it was planning for the USA. It was a trip while I'll never forget, and so it was a lot of fun. How often have you looked at the shot from the Final Four? Uh, haven't looked at it one time. I don't want to watch the game. I don't want to think about that. It was a tough time, and so uh, for me, I'm moving forward. Moving forward. How much did you think it was going in, though? <laughs> I would have bet all my money was going in. Um, that, that baseline fade away, but um, didn't happen. So, uh, like I said, excited about what, what's coming up in my future. If Indiana's pick is on the board and you're still available, what are you going to be thinking? Uh, I mean, it would be special to play for them, just because growing up there and my whole life and kind of. Uh, being a lifelong Pacer fan with, with Reggie Miller and Rick Smith and the Davis brothers and all that. But um, I think playing in anywhere would be special to me, but obviously playing in Indiana would be really special. Well, good luck this week. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Gordon Hayward, which provided one of the best moments we've seen in years at the Final Four. If only that shot had gone down. Go down the list, Trevor Booker, another guy who is undersized as a power forward, but throughout this year and the beginning in last season, he really worked to improve on perimeter skills, putting it on the floor, shooting that short-range jump shot, and, and being able to guard bigger guys on, on the other end. And you could see the development and the improvement to the point where he was an all-conference player and really the leader of that team. But in the end, I think Trevor Booker is one of those guys that has a chance because he's become more of a skilled player. I, I think a lot of players have things that you question from time to time. But the one thing you cannot question about Trevor Booker is his heart. I mean, that kid has heart, and he plays hard and plays with passion every single possession. And when he attacks the rim, he attacks it with a ferocity like no other. I mean, he wants to literally pull the rim down to the floor. He does possess the ability to shoot the basketball. You can see him in a pick and pop. Uh, some things he does need to work on, I think finishing around the basket with his right hand, I don't think he was able to do a lot this year. But as far as playing with pure tenacity each and every possession, that's something he continuously brings to the table. See number 47 there? Guy played at Notre Dame. Enigma? Or just a 2010 guy, they, he played in the Big East, 2010 has to count for something. Huh? He doesn't fit any prototype. Now, his biggest issue, as you mentioned, Chad, being undersized at a power position, he had a lot of trouble when playing kind of the center position at Notre Dame against the seven-footers, the 6'10 guys, particularly guys with length and, and capable of blocking shots. But make no mistake about it, no one's going to outwork him. He uses his strength well. He's not as explosive as people might think, but somehow he gets his shot off. Tried to work on a perimeter game this year with mixed results. But in the end, I mean, look, this is a guy, he's not quite Tyler Hansbro, but he's the kind of guy that you want to give a chance to because he works so hard, stayed till his senior year, and he will give you everything he has. You mentioned 6'6". Six, six. He's listed at 6'8". He's, he's more 6'6". Six, six. Uh, I think we're going to see his results come in closer to 6'6". Six, six. He's just not, he's not that big. He's got an unorthodox shot. Uh, you, you know, th those guys are always tough, right? You have a great college career. How does your game translate to the NBA? You know, Billy, maybe you can talk a little bit about it. What are the key things? Well, I mean, the one thing is you say 6'6", six, six, is that without shoes or with shoes? Because we'll get the measurements. I always say if you play with shoes, if you're 6'8", six, that's what you play with. The one thing is I think he'll, he'll fit somewhere. He's just got to find the right niche. Well, 22 points, 9 rebounds. Mike Bray was his head coach at Notre Dame, and he's standing by with Andy. Yeah, if you guys can't sell Luke Heron Gordy, I know someone who can. Mike, this is the second year in a row that Luke is here. What does he need to prove in this setting and then when he does the individual workouts to be a decent draft pick? You know, I, I think there may be some concern about his length because that league is so long. Uh, but well, that's not going to change. That ain't going to change. But you know what? I, I, I look and I've been watching the playoffs. You know, the motor is there every day, Andy, as you know. He comes after you every day. Um, you know, the one thing that cannot be sold short, he makes open shots from 5, 15, even 25. He makes the NBA 3. We know he's going to wrestle and physically go after stuff, but the shot-making ability when they double off, of him, double off on other people, 
I think it's something that's going to set him aside just from talking to people here today. I saw him work out the other day at the 360 Athletic Club in Reseda, and he still makes shots. So when you get him in these workouts against players that are like him, he's working out with Damian James at Texas, what does he need to show in like the one-on-ones, the two-on-twos when he's in these kind of grinding workouts? I think moving his feet defensively against some of the athletic ability and speed and the big guys. You know, when I think about him, if he's with your second unit and he comes off the bench with your second unit, he can guard the other second team four. I don't know if the second team four on the other team can guard him, though. And if you think about it in that context, and that's what I've talked to people here about, I think you could have somebody that could be you know, a long 10-year guy here. I mean, the consensus here last year was, Mike, he's going to be in the league 10 years, but he should come back for a year. Thank God, you know, but I enjoyed that. He is kind of making up some lost ground because he was hurt, Andy, and he was off the radar, and he didn't finish with a flurry. But he's kind of going into this like he came to Notre Dame. He was supposed to play in the Mid-American Conference, if you remember, and the rest is history, what he did in the Big East. And I told him this morning, I said, just attack it like you did when you came to Notre Dame. You have nothing to lose. Now, you can't hear Billy King, but he wants to know why when he was at Duke and you were Duke assistant uh, that there wasn't any kind of tutelage about his jumper. We kept Billy away from shooting the basketball as much as possible. And um, basically, you you didn't have to guard him. The thing is, Billy was so good, though, you couldn't take him off the floor because he coached the team. He ran the locker room. He ran everything. But... uh, that wasn't my call, but if I was a head coach, I would have agreed with Mike K. No shots for number 55, Billy King. Now, it's a little unfair because you can't hear Billy's rebuttal here, but for the opposing view, let's go back to Billy King. No, and Mike was right. I couldn't shoot, so they made the smart decision not to let me shoot the basketball. Let Danny Ferry shoot because he was much better at it than I was. But uh, Mike Ray was a, uh, started his career at Duke when his, I was a, my senior. He was an assistant coach there. What's what was he supposed to be, Andy Sullivan, a miracle? I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, most shots you got off in the game? Oh, maybe like eight. And I, I usually took them early in the game because they put a bad defender on me, so I'd get layups and then they switch and then I'd go back to just passing them all. Yeah, you get back to Heron Goaty. We talk, I mean, it is what it is. It's not five on five, but a five on five probably would suit him better, huh? To show what he can do on the floor. Hey, you know, yeah, another guy, clearly. You, you know, and it, it, it's interesting. We haven't talked about him yet. Patrick Patterson is here from Kentucky. You know, another guy who maybe isn't always going to show the greatest in a skills type of thing like this, but you see his productive career at Kentucky. You see how he's improved his game, added elements to his game this year, a jump shot, uh, even shooting the three a little bit for Kentucky this year. And, and you know, you've got to applaud him because he's the only power forward here who is projected as a potential lottery pick. You look, Ed Davis skipped, even though he does have an injury. You can understand that one a little bit. Derek Favors isn't here. Greg Monroe isn't here. Udo isn't here. Patrick Patterson is here, still trying to prove to guys he's not going to wow you. But he does a little bit of everything well, and I think he's going to be a very good pick for whoever gets him, and they're going to get value on him. Well, I think this is an agent's misconception of what this thing is all about, because when you don't let your guys come out, what are you hiding? You're hiding comparisons? You can always get tape and film to do that. Let them come out here, as we said, and confirm what they're capable of doing. But but going back to Luke Herringoti for a second, you notice Mike Gray said a lot of folks here said he might be a 10-year player in this league. You know, he's one of those guys that's a glue guy. He may not, but he'll come and get you an offensive rebound, knock down some shots, maybe able to guard some folks. And you always want a guy like that coming off the bench. As I mentioned, compare him to Tyler Hansbrough. In college, he might have been right on par with him. And in the pros, it may be the same thing. I think there's always a need for a guy who's going to be consistent with his habits every single day. A guy who's going to come into practice, have a blue-collar mentality, work hard, rebound, yes sir, no sir, not give you any problems off the court. And I think that's what Luke Heron Gordy brings to the table. He is mentally and physically one of the toughest kids I've seen in a while come to college basketball with a long life in Tyler Hansburg. Heron Gordy trying to work himself into the draft. You mentioned Patrick Patterson, so let's go back to Patterson. You have him going in the first round. Does he get bonus points for showing up and playing here? Well, I, I don't think it hurts him. I think the fact that I mean, he's here, he's going to work hard. I think he just got to show what he's done. Like Jason said earlier, Jason said earlier, you to be who you are. Do what the things you do best. And that's one thing. If he goes out there and work hard, you know, he's a guy that there's got, always going to be a need for guys like that. You really want to see this young man succeed. I mean, he decides to stay in school another year to work on different aspects of his game, putting the ball down on the ground, maybe play more in the perimeter trying to sue his game more for the NBA style. And also, he graduated school. Yeah. This guy graduated school. He's a guy just like Tyler Hansbrough. Well, comes back, graduates school, and is able to accomplish kill two birds with one stone. 
Yeah, you mentioned the fact that he doesn't do anything spectacular, but across the board he does a lot of things well, and he didn't have any problem at all sharing that spotlight in Lexington, did he? I think that shows a lot. Uh, you know, he didn't get jealous. Either. There wasn't any any locker room uh, problems. I, I, I was impressed with how he handled himself, how he stood up as a leader on that team. Uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a guy who I think is this, the typical, he's not going to wow you, but he's going to be in the league a long time. He's going to be Adonis Haslam or, or, you know, somebody like that who everybody's going to respect, who's going to get big minutes. Um, and, you, you know, I, I'm a big fan. You know, Chad, also, he took ownership in that team. There were a couple of games where he didn't play as well, and he stepped up and said, I need to play better. And for my team, I have a better chance to win games. And, and he taught John Wall and Eric Bledsoe. There were times where they're in a screen and roll where sometimes John would go a little too fast, and you would see during the next timeout or the next huddle, Patrick would pull him to the side and say, listen, take your time, come up a little slower. So that kind of teaching is something that you need from a point, a, a power forward, a small forward like that. And speaking of the Kentucky Wildcats, uh, five players in the draft. You can see most players drafted in the first round, the UConn, North Carolina, Duke. Wow, Kentucky, all five go in the first round? I think they're all going in the first round. It's a question of whether all five go in the lottery. Uh, you know, I think Bledsoe and Patterson are the guys who might slip into the mid-first round. I think Orton, for sure, uh, well, I think he's a 10 to 15 pick. And we, we know that DeMarcus Cousins is going to go in the probably the top five, six, and John Wall's going to go number one. You know, it's interesting. You go back to school. Sometimes it works out for you. It worked out for Patrick Patterson. Craig Brackens is another interesting guy. He decides to go back to school. Could have been a lottery pick last year. Uh, every NBA AGM was very impressed with him. His team struggles. Obviously, he starts getting the double and triple teams in the Big 12 this year because everybody knows who Craig Brackens is. And his numbers don't look as good. And, you know, and I talked with him because he slipped. He slid all the way out of the first round on many NBA boards. I talked with him. Do you regret going back to school? I really appreciated his answer because he was like, no, I became a better basketball player. All right, I didn't have as good a season statistically, but look at how teams were guarding me. Look at the lack of talent on our team. Look at the triple teams I faced every night. I learned how to persevere. And I think I'm a better basketball player. And, you know, the more I watched him and then started watching work out, how is this kid so different that his sophomore year he's a lottery, now he's a second-round pick? I think he'll move up in the draft. Flip Saunders there, the, uh, the head coach of the Washington Wizards. Uh, he'll be coaching uh, Jonathan Wall next year. And Pat Riley, of course, the big question is, will he coach again uh, in Miami? There's Larry Bird. Every time Larry Legend's uh, in the building, uh, people take notice. Day one of two here. Yeah, the ESPN News coverage, uh, eight hours of coverage of the 2010 NBA Draft Combine. Let's go back now to Craig Brackens. You were talking about uh, how he is a better player now than he was a year ago, even though a lot of people criticize the fact that he did go back. Well, uh, again, this is a guy that's got a big-picture outlook now that it's done. You know, as Chad mentioned earlier in the show, it's about the second contract. And I think that guys who become more fundamentally sound, who have more experience, even, they, even though they may slip, out of the first round they're going to be on somebody's roster and if we look at the nba draft since the so-called one and done rule has been in place the majority of the early entrants have been juniors so they've been long enough they've been there long enough to prepare their games to prepare for that second contract and ostensibly if you use the ncaa's uh, apr you know academic progress rate you know these guys should be three quarters of the way to a degree so they're accomplishing two things I think whatever team takes Craig Brackens in the first round, if he does go in the first round, it's going to be extremely lucky. I, I would say he plays in the Big 12. That's a very difficult conference. And plus, I mean, they went through losing one of their leading scores. He went overseas earlier. Uh, so whenever I, I think that's one of the things that happened to make us really good at Duke was the fact that I was playing alongside three or four of the guys that were high draft picks as well. So I was able to hide a little bit. Not saying hide, but other options, whereas Craig Brackens this year for his team was the main option every single game. So he was getting double and triple team which actually lowered his numbers and it would be hypocritical to judge Brackens on his numbers and then say a guy like Orton for Kentucky yeah. is going to be in the lottery yeah. and he yeah. played hard he hardly played, played any exactly. minutes so I don't understand that and you know the same action you know the other thing about Brackens that you want to point out is he has a skill too it's not just inside he can stretch the floor I saw him shooting the three he shoots that well it could be a Rasheed Wallace type of player and the other thing that shocked me was they were talking in the gym who do you think has a better vertical wait, leap, wait, Stanley wait, Robinson wait, wait, or Craig, wait, wait. Craig Brackens? You, know, you watch, and it's Stanley Robinson. Craig Brackens made it with a 40-inch vertical. Eyes up, quick move. Uh, that, that, that shocked a lot of guys. He's a better athlete 
than maybe he shows because of the type of game that he has. I think he's a guy, when he gets into workouts, when he does the combine thing here, he can shoot right back up. And we could be seeing him, seeing him at the end of the lottery again. We mentioned that 40 inch vertical. He said a lot of his friends from uh, Ames, Iowa, called and said, there's, there's no way you can jump 40, huh? <laughs> Well, we'll want to see him repeat it tomorrow yeah. on Friday, that's for sure. 6'11", 230, he plays with the that's fours, so what does he play at? 230, does he stay there, or does he put on weight in the NBA? Well, I think he'll put on a little bit of weight. I think it all depends on what position you want to play, but I actually think for a lot of these guys, I remember coming out, it was the first time, and we tried to do it as much as possible. It was the first time I actually started to learn about my body, about eating right, about weightlifting right, about doing the right thing, to be ready to be in NBA shape, which is completely different than, I think, college shape. Well, the fours are on the floor, and some of the coaches are mic'd, so let's listen in right now with John Lawyer. Nice job. Come on, now. You know, you know John worked with me in Philadelphia, and he's very, he's very good. At, we're working with guys, he's a good coach. Here, shooter up top. Okay, same action now. Midpoint, hard right elbow, hard left elbow. Still eight shots. Here we go, ball game. See, I love watching drills like this, actually hard seeing the footwork of players. You're seeing Trevor Booker right there coming into the shot. Is he really playing that left foot coming to the right? Is he really playing that right foot to pivot off when he comes to the left? Did it that time. Your ability to get your shot off quicker in NBA is something that you really need to have because guys are a lot stronger and a lot longer with more length. So to get that shot off quicker is something that you need to have in order to be a better scorer. Let's go. Interesting. Earlier today, you said that some of these coaches too. It's an audition for them as well. Well, it is because you know they've got a lot of GMs and uh, sitting in the stands, and some of these guys have aspirations of being head coaches. You know, I remember uh, Sam Mitchell once worked this camp. You know, was a head coach. Rick Carlisle was one time worked this coach this camp. So a lot of these guys want to prove the GMs that they can teach and coach as well. Come on, quick move. You know, we're, we're watching these guys on the camera right now, but I can tell you almost every NBA GM is looking down at the other end of the court because Ryan Richards is a guy that, that teams don't really know. In fact, at one of the breaks, I was approached by a director of a player personnel who wanted to know, know his agent, wanted to know more about him. They didn't even really have him on the radar. But when you're that size and you come into a setting like this and you start to show some skill and you start to look like you belong, Everybody's excited. They've seen all these other guys hundreds of times. They haven't seen this kid, and he's showing really well right now. He's making himself and his agent lots of money. And then I think that goes exactly, it goes exactly back to your point, how skilled he is. I mean, he had all the proper footwork on that curl move with the basketball, and he's shooting lights out. And the thing is, for a kid who just turned 19, as a GM, you have to see the potential future of this young man and what kind of success he could bring into the NBA. Yeah, and in this same drill, you're looking at Jarvis Bernardo, again, a guy who is probably the best defensive player, shot blocker in America. He's not as fluid. And again, it, it depends on how you train. It depends on how you develop. And this is big for Bernardo to show that he has you know, other skills. If, if it can catapult him into the first round to round out those skills, there'll be a place for Bernardo on somebody's roster because he can block shots. But and in the end, it's going to come down to him rounding out the skills and comparing him to Richards right now. You know, like you said, all eyes are on Richards. Well, that's he's going to be the conversation every lunch table today when all these oh, yeah. gyms leave. Who is Ryan Richards? Find out more about him. Get more tape. Can we get him in? Get tape. I mean, they're, they're probably GMs calling back to the office now. Get and, more tape. And he, just has an advantage. Too. he has an advantage <laughs> over every college player because the NCAA set the date up to May 8th. He has until June 15th to decide whether he wants to stay right. in this draft. So he has time to go work out for some of these NBA teams. And one, just one note on Varnado. Okay, okay. He is an amazing shot blocker. And even if he can't get it done offensively, we know he's very raw there. Why couldn't he be a Chris Anderson type player in the NBA? He's athletic, well, he has a great said. motor, and he can block those shots. I said, yeah, he's yeah. going to be on somebody's yeah. roster. There is no question about it. Well, not only can he block shots, uh, he's consistent. 179 blocks in back-to-back -back years. How about those numbers? Jerry Sloan, he could be uh, losing Carlos Boozer to free agency this summer, and so he's uh, looking for a, a big guy to bring into uh, Utah. And we were talking about Jarvis Renato. I stand corrected. I said he had back-to-back -back seasons with 170. 170 in back-to-back -back seasons, Jay. 
are you going to break down his game? He's actually passionate about the game. He wants to be the best, and he wants to win. That kind of mentality can really translate over to the NBA. Well, the thing that gives him value, again, is the defensive prowess. Not only to block shots, but to take up the room. And when he does block shots, I haven't been a shot blocker myself. The one thing that I learned you from your watching <laughs> Bill Russell. I didn't say I blocked as many. I just said I blocked a few. But the one thing that you learn from Bill Russell is keep it in bounds. And yeah. if you look at just about all of his blocks, he's not swatting it into the third row where the other team regains possession. He's trying to get it out there, make it a 50-50 opportunity, even knock it the other way so his team can start the fast break. And that's intentional. That's not by accident. You know, we talked before the commercial break. We showed him with Richards over there working out. You talked about his offensive game. Playing a power six conference in the SEC. 18 double-doubles. How much more advanced does his offensive game have to be to have a long career in the NBA? Well, it would help if you could throw it into him and rely on him maybe getting you a need basket or getting to the free throw line. He doesn't have to be a 20 point per game scorer. He just needs to be a threat inside, a consistent threat. Because again, his strength is blocking shots on the other end. And I know a whole lot of guys who made a living playing on the defensive end and just being a consistent threat offensively. We came out of that commercial break. We shot, uh, saw Jerry Sloan at the Utah Jazz, and we jumped right back into Varnado. But uh, you had something on Jerry Sloan? Well, you know, actually more important than this thing are going to be the medicals we talked about in the interviews. I was at the draft lottery, and I heard an interesting story about Jerry Sloan in one of these interviews. He's an intimidating guy. You can imagine prospects coming in and being interviewed by Jerry Sloan. One of the players came in, a two-guard kind of cocky. Jerry Sloan asked him, well, how do you think you're going to fare against uh, Kobe Bryant? How do you think you're going to fare against guys like that? He's like, hey, I'm a pretty good player, too. And then he said, so I got another question for you. What did all your teammates think when you took all those stupid shots in the game that I saw the other day? <laughs> Shut that kid down. <laughs> got to love Jerry Sloan. Yeah. Got to love Jerry Sloan. No, I mean, because I heard that same story. And that's the great thing about Jerry Sloan. He's going to be direct and to the point. It's like when the guys were hurting the playoffs. Jerry's like, hey, they're getting a paycheck. They got to go play. We'll play for Cinco. And, and that's an interesting kid. We interviewed for Cinco in the draft. Interviews are pretty interesting. All right, Jay, let's uh, take a look at Varnado's uh, release. Well, you know, just something as far as him developing his turnaround face-up game, you're seeing when a ball comes off his hands, it's kind of difficult from the angle. It's kind of, it's all fingertips, really, really fingertips. I mean, even his, his thumb is really used in this shot. And your thumb is supposed to be actually be released, and the ball is supposed to be on those four fingers and just come off your index finger. So, obviously, things he still needs to work on, but his offensive game is still raw, which only gives you, I mean, he, he wants to work. He wants to become better as well. Yeah, I mean, you looked at that jump shot, and you saw a lot. Uh, he's a right-handed shooter, too much left hand on the ball. It almost was a two-hand yeah. shot. Uh, with his length, getting him down on the post and working on footwork, drop step, if you can use the, your footwork to get your shots, he can extend with a jump hook. I mean, that can be his go-to move. As a big man, you need a go-to move inside. And particularly if you're a guy who's strong on the defensive end, you just need to be a threat on the offensive end. Work on that go-to move. Now, there were things he did against Kentucky, against DeMarcus Cousins, where he was able to turn around, face up real quick, put the ball on the ground, and use his quickness to get by DeMarcus Cousins. So he does have understanding of what he can do well. Will he be able to do that on the NBA level, going against guys who are a lot taller, more athletic? Uh, you don't know, because they have a lot more length on that level. You know, I'm just grabbing a name out of a past year, but listening to you guys talk, I was thinking uh, back to Ohio State when they had some pretty good teams. Kenny Johnson had a cup of coffee in the NBA. He used to block almost as many shots as uh, Bernardo, but obviously Bernardo's offensive game is more advanced than Kenny Johnson's was at that point. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily recall Kenny Johnson blocking shots. It really depends on, on your environment. It depends on how you're doing it within your system and that type of thing. But again, you look at Bernardo and you also look at his size, his length. You're going to look at footwork. Right. The offensive side of it, that's why I say he might be able to crack into the first round if he can round his game off and show some potential in the skills on the offensive Yeah, end. he's got a 7-6 wingspan. He's an explosive leaper. I mean, you look at his body, he's going to have to hit the NBA weight room, but I talked to him. I saw him work out in L.A. He didn't lift weights at Mississippi State. He wasn't in great shape. He said, he said and I was shocked to hear this, he thought he was in the best shape of his life after working out for three weeks in L.A., even when he was playing college basketball at Mississippi State. So you, you don't know with a lot of these kids Just everything right that's going book. on. Um, you know, with him, and, and he's going to get stronger. You know an NBA team's going to put the weights on him. He's going to, and that's going to help him as much as anything. But you know one thing, Chad, everybody says, guys got bodies, got... 
people's bodies will match it on. I think you don't want to put un unnatural right. weight on guys' body because then you lose that athletic ability to shot block it. I mean, Danny Ferry, who played me at Duke, when he went to Cleveland, they didn't over this. They bulked him up and made him power forward, and then he had knee problems. I think people's bodies will naturally gain the weight. Chad, let's start with you. Let's talk about some of the guys that, that did not show up today, but we'll see them at least jump and run tomorrow. Well, you know, Derek Favors is obviously the big name there. You look at a guy who... Uh, at the start of the season, we had ranked as the number two prospect in the draft. A guy every, compared to everybody from Amari Stoudemire to a young Antonio McDyess. Um, he, he seems like a perfect fit with the New Jersey Nets. Uh, I think the three new person on that roster, and he's been hurt, I think, a lot this year, was Ed Davis. I think last year people were expecting him to be a top five pick, Chad, right? right. But he decided to stay in school. And uh, talking to a couple of scouts, he got a chance to really critique his game a lot more. I don't think there was one possession where he knocked over that right shoulder when he was in the paint. Now, he does possess a lot of offensive skills. If you take the ball in a perimeter, maybe put the ball down on the ground a little bit. But I think that's one of the cases where he could have been drafted a lot higher last year instead of this year, obviously, going through injury. And, and, his, and, his, and his wrist is in a cast still. It's one of the reasons he, he couldn't, couldn't be here. Yes. And that, that's going to hurt him in workouts. But he did get after it on the boards. And, I, I mean, that's one thing. You look at his athlete, athleticism, his length, and the way that he crashed the boards. And, you know, I've heard guys compare him to Dale Davis. You may say, well, Dale Davis, you know, that shouldn't be a top ten pick. Dale Davis in the league 16 years. I think you'd be happy you got Dale Davis. But, again, he was a guy that last year would have been drafted on potential. Exactly. This year, it still may be some potential, but, again, people were seeing what he could do. Carolina obviously had a dismal year, even when he was playing. He put up some numbers, but it didn't translate into wins for them. Kentucky Wildcats of five one and dunners, and uh, Chad saying that all five will probably go in the first round. Oklahoma and Seton Hall, each with three most underclassmen entered in the 2010 NBA draft. Seton Hall, of course, uh, some of those guys heading back, and right now let's head on down and listen to Andy Katz. Well, one of those five players is Patrick Patterson, the elder statesman of that Kentucky class. And Patrick, all five of you guys that are underclassmen in the NBA draft are projected to go in the first round. How realistic did you think that was when you guys all got together earlier this fall? Um, you know, I knew John was going to be top five in the markets from seeing him play, and I felt like I could be a first round, you know, but seeing Eric play and Daniel play, you know, I started to believe more and more that, hey, we could all be first round, if not top 25, you know, maybe even higher. So it, it began to get more realistic as the season progressed, and now that we're here, you know, I definitely think all of us can go, you know, a top 20 possibility. Why are you ready to contribute next season in the NBA? I just feel like it's my time. You know, I've done everything I need to do at the University of Kentucky, and, and I just feel like it's my time. My bad. I just feel like it's my time to take my game to the next level, and uh, you know, just provide a lot of um, a lot of myself for an NBA team. What do you have to convince the teams that you can do that maybe you didn't show in college that you can do at the NBA level? Definitely guarding the perimeter, uh, expanding my jump shot and my ball handling. Uh, I, I believe that. Throughout my years at the University of Kentucky, they saw me play in the post with my back to the basket, posting up a 15-foot jump shot. So I definitely believe coming here and throughout this whole process, I need to show NBA teams, coaches, managers that I can shoot from the perimeter, I can shoot the three, I can score in one-on-one -on -one situations, I can drive the basketball, and I'm okay with ball handling. All right, Patrick, good luck. One of five Kentucky players that more than likely will be in the first round. Back to you guys. All right, Andy, thanks a lot. And once again, Kentucky with five, the most players in the 2010 draft. Uh, John Wall is in the building here this afternoon. We'll, we'll see him uh, probably, Chad, work out a little bit tomorrow. Oh, we'll, we'll see him do some, uh, some jumping, jumping and, 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 you know, some sprinting and some lateral drills, but that's it. You know, the one thing in that, and I remember watching him when they first instituted as a GM, it was good to see how competitive, because guys got competitive even in that. They were like, what's my time? What's my time? Well, the other thing, he's, he's going to be fantastic. I mean, you talk about John Wall. He's not an elite athlete. He's like an extraterrestrial athlete. I mean, you, you look at the way he jumps and then jumps again in the air. I mean, he's unbelievable that way, and this, this is where he'll shine. Guys, I have a home in Durham, North Carolina, and I got a chance to see him play 
his junior and his senior year of high school. And from his junior year on, I mean, I, I, and it could have happened before that. I didn't get a chance to see him before that. I mean, he's an amazing athlete. I mean, from him doing windmills in high school on top of people in traffic, and once again, his ability to maneuver in traffic at full speed and change direction is something I think he does like no other. He can get to the rim. He can finish over the top of players. I think some things he needs to develop are floaters, but he can have, he has the ability to finish with little scoop shots too. And, and that's the next question, his ability to not consistently knock down the jump shot from the outside, but there's no doubt about it. He's the most dominant player in this draft. You know, it's interesting. His teammate's not here, DeMarcus Cousins. We're looking at the centers now. A couple of other guys, uh, Cole Aldridge, isn't here. Daniel Orton, another one of his teammates, isn't here. Hassan Whiteside. But it's interesting because I've had NBA teams talk about DeMarcus Cousins and say if he had a clean mental bill of health, if they thought this kid was the greatest kid, he would be the number one pick, not John Wall. Curious what you guys think about that. Well, I, I think, you know, he does. I, I've said that he has all the attributes to be that guy, but it's the, the question marks. But, but do you wonder if you pass on, you know, you say, okay, Something's going to pass on him, and if he puts it all together, later down the road they're going to say, geez, they took him instead of him. Not to inject, like, uh, anything close to lawyerly talk, but somebody's got to define clean mental, clean bill of <laughs> mental health. Is it a lack of maturity? Does he have some issues? I mean, I don't know, and, and I think for those GMs to say that it might be a little bit unfair. The bottom line for me is as watching him, uh, progressed during the season. It might have been a lack of maturity, something that he saw it appeared towards the end when pushed, he didn't push back pretty much, that he understood how to play the game, how to stay in the game. And I don't know. I mean, with a guy like that, with that size, you know, I don't see how he couldn't be the number one guy, except, again, this is a league of trends. Look what Derrick Rose did for the Bulls. Yeah. And let's call it is what it is, too. I mean, it, it, a lot of these guys come from high schools where they're the most dominant player in the high school, even to the aspect where they dominate the coach. I mean, sometimes, you know, the coach do this, and I don't want to do that. I'm going to do this. And what's the coach going to do? Take him out of the game? So now for the first time in their lives, they're really challenged by a coach who is that dominant figure. Now, Kyle Perry's not going to step down to DeMarcus Cousins. Maybe DeMarcus Cousins used to have him this way. So I think that is going to be a future challenge for him in handling that playing against Gold Man. But I still I think guards win championships. Nothing against you guys. <laughs> very, very important. You guys have us on every way. I think guards won championship. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it, it, a it, it, it seems like it's there's a, a comparison jabbing. between the debate between Derrick Rose and Michael Beasley a couple of years ago. Michael Beasley actually statistically had the better year. Um, he was a dominant scorer, dominant rebounder. Bulls picked Derrick Rose, even though they could have used a guy like Michael Beasley. I think it's a similar debate this year. Yeah, and, and you or point guards have more responsibility. Okay, well, these guys are not nearly as important. Orlando did the ball without us. <laughs> yeah. A little slap happy here. We're three hours into the four-hour broadcast right now. That's let's it, talk only about, three hours? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about some of the bigs out on the floor well, right because, now. Because I think as they it, argue between yeah. guards and, uh, and uh, the big guys down in the trenches. You know, we talked about the fours that weren't here, but uh, maybe we should talk about some of the fives that didn't show up in day one, huh? Well, as we said, you know, Cole Aldridge is not here. Orton, you know, some of these guys, you know, you, you, they had a great college career. They're not here. And they're going to be question marks because there are already question marks about some of them as it is. So it's going to, you're going to find out more as they come in and work out for people. Daniel Orton, you know, what is he? You know, he's big. Can he, where is he going to fit? Yeah. There's a lot of question marks there. Well, Tiny Gallon of Oklahoma, he is here, and he's working out. So, uh and Chad, you have him sliding and are sneaking into the first round. Yeah, I watched him walk pick. out of New York, and and, and he T Tiny's going to be upset because uh, you know they were doing low post drills with him. He started complaining to the coaches, "I'm a face the basket guy." And then he went out, and this guy, I'm not kidding you, I'm not exaggerating, shot 70, 75 percent from three points all the way around, and he was exhausted. He's not in great shape, but he's a skilled big man. And my guess is they're not going to run these guys through drills where they're shooting NBA threes. He would destroy everybody out here as far as the big guys go. When they well, he might have question. skills shooting a three, but I saw him because uh, I did the McDonald's All-American game that he played in, and that's where he scored most of his points. He can handle a little bit. He can go up and down the floor, step outside and shoot. But, again, that's not what's going to be called for when he gets to this league. Especially for somebody like him where the shape has been the factor for him the whole year. We've heard Jeff Cable talk about it. We've heard scouts talk about it. You have to come into this draft camp 
in best shape, ready to go to prove the scouts that you can be in great and top tier shape. Well, you hit on a point. I mean, we, we sit here and we've been talking about scouts trying to gamesmanship a little bit, not wanting their guy to compete against this guy, or that guy. But that's a point as well. How can you come here out of shape? Well, some of them may not be here because they may not be in the condition that they want to be. And, and you know, in fairness, I talked to the kid. He started working out a week ago. It took him a while to pick his agent. Uh, he. Uh, it, this is the draft. Yeah, you got to get you ready need, for the you draft. You need an agent to get you to work out? You got a college coach <laughs> yeah, that can tell you to coach. do that. But, but you, guys, you guys know this. Not all of these kids have the life experience to understand everything that you need to do. They need an agent. They need someone telling them, helping them, okay. pushing then, them okay, along. Then, then that, that's an GM. indictment. That's an indictment of their college coaches then, without question. Because also, that I'm going to be the GM then. All right, now, now when, it, when I end up drafting this kid, I'm going to need his agent to make sure he does everything because he had a college coach. We're going to give him millions of dollars guarantee. Now, what's going to make this kid do it with the money in his pocket? He didn't do it when he didn't have the money. Now you give him the money. What's going to make him do it? That's the question that GMs have to ask. And I think most of the college coaches have understood that. That may be true in, in very few cases. But I think these college coaches, it's up to the young man to be able to develop a relationship with the college coach because it only reflects yeah. well on the college coach if this young man is successful. Exactly. I've heard two things. You said how effective he was shooting the three, talking about Tiny Gallup, which I don't doubt. You said that's not the position or where they're going to want him to play at the next level. Let's say they convince this young guy to stay down in the low post. That's where he's going to play. Is he a happy, happy camper? And in his heart, he thinks he's a three-point shooter? Well, you know what? If he sticks in the league, he'll, he'll, I'm sure he'll be happy. I, I mean, you're just talking about what type of player he thinks he is. You guys know this, right? A lot of players think they're a certain type of player. Uh, three Threes think they're point guards. Uh, you know, two guards think they're point guards. Uh, big men think they're, you know, power forward, they need to be centers. I mean, you know, that's all part of the maturity thing. I, I, I'm just saying he's not the first guy to show up here right. in no, not no. great shape. Yeah, no, Paul Millsap right. showed up here a few years ago, 20 pounds Should overweight. There's maturity the issues, right? Um, and you can't Make lose track of the fact, though, that he has no some things that are NBA skills agree. Um, that no. you're going to be interested in. I agree. In. And, and, and usually you find that's why you want to interview the kid. That's why you want to give the psych test. test because you want to find out why is there are these deficiencies in, in his weight. You know, just one, one other quick example. He, he, he went to work out about 20, about 10, 15 minutes into the workout. He had to stop the workout for a second. I thought, man, this guy, he's not going to make it. He's out of shape. He came back in. He, his sister was with him. He asked him to get a banana. He told me after, the, after that, he went into the workout. Didn't eat breakfast. Now, I mean, as an adult, I'm like, what kind of guy goes into a workout like that? Does it put a little fuel in your system before you get started? Got a little dizzy. Again, life experience, maturity. You know, stay, you stay, stay in college. You know. Stay in college. And get, and, and get focused. Don't go in the real world. We're inside TAC Athletic Training Facility here in Chicago, Illinois, at the 2010 NBA Draft Combine, along with Jay Williams, uh, Billy King, Len Elmore, Chad Ford. Uh, I'm Mike Gleason. Great to have you with us here. Uh, the first of two-day coverage on ESPNU, and right now we check back in with Andy Katz. Well, join me now, Luke Herringotti of Notre Dame. A little deja vu. I feel like this was just a year ago. What's the biggest difference from a year ago? Uh, that I know what's going on here. I, there's nothing new to expect. I know the whole Drew and the routine, so it feels good having gone through this already once. A year ago, what were your emotions? How anxious were you? Very anxious to know what to expect, you know, nervous. Whether or not I was going back to school or not, you know, this year I'm just, my both feet are in and I feel good. I saw you in LA the other day. You feel good, you look good. How much better prepared are you to enter the NBA at this point? I think I'm a lot better than last year, uh, especially mentally. Uh, as I mentioned before, I know what's going on this time and what I need to do to put it in to get a good draft pick. So I feel really good as of now. What are the criticisms that you hear that you know you can't do anything about? Height. I mean, that's never going to change. It's not like I'm going to sprout four inches overnight. So you know, I just got to deal with that. And if that's going to hurt me, so be it. But I battled that through it my whole life. So. I accept the challenge. What do you need to prove when you do the team workouts leading up to the draft? Uh, just things like getting my shot off as I did in college, you know, against the bigger athletic guys. And, you know, I've proved I can do that so far, and I just saw I continue to will. All right, good luck this week. All right, thank you very much, Andy. Let's talk about the Texas Longhorn now, Dexter Pittman. 6'10", 285. They say he's a magnet for personal fouls, but he really only, if you look at his stats, he only fouled out of three games. But uh, speaking of weight issues, Len, you were talking about Tiny Gallon and Dexter Pittman. He has his under control? 
Well, I mean, to the extent that he can. I mean, it's an ongoing process, I'm sure. But I remember when Pittman was a freshman, pretty much the same year Kevin Durant was a freshman, and they put Pittman on a program where he had to learn how to eat, where he had to learn how to work out. And as I said, he was he's maybe 15, 20 pounds overweight now from where he probably needs to be, but that's better than being 100 pounds overweight. And he learned it from staying in school and developing a nutritional habit. That's part of the critical life skills that you learn in college as well. And it, it may not be all about just playing basketball and getting out here. It's about learning a lot of things. Let's check back in with Andy, who's standing by with Danny Ferry. Andy? Thanks, Mike. Joined here by Danny Ferry. Now, the Cavs don't have a selection in this draft, so what do you need to see here? Well, I mean, there's always an opportunity for our team to uh, get in the draft. You know, there'll be draft day trades, things of that nature. So we have our staff here, and we're watching and making sure that we're prepared. How are you approaching this July? I mean, there's no secret elephant in the room that you obviously have to try to sign LeBron James. So what, what are the other things that you have to do? Well, I think the organization in general is, uh, you know, focused on plan A, is, is continue to build uh, the, the best organization and, and uh, a championship organization. That's what we'll continue to do. That's really been our focus for the last five years, and that'll be the focus for as long as, as long as Dan Gilbert owns the team. How confident are you that you can deal with Plan A and get James locked up? Well, again, you know, I, I think right now we're, we're, we're disappointed from the year. It's been an emotional end of the year uh, for any team that's losing right now, and we're watching the draft, focusing on this stuff, and uh, starting to talk about next year and, and, and planning for that stuff. And what's the timetable for the evaluation of uh, Coach Brown? Uh, again, we're talking internally. Mike's been great to work with. I love working with him, and uh, you know, he's, he's our coach right now, and I'm, I'm excited to be able to say that. Well, thanks for joining us, Danny. Thanks. Back to you guys, Mike. All right, Andy, thanks a lot. Uh, another Duke guy, Danny yeah, Ferry. Say, have, have we met our quota <laughs> of I know that was gonna come right up. now? Defensive, <laughs> offensive players of the year. Come on. Well, Danny Perry could certainly stroke it. Hey, you, 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 you hear that Maryland Terp getting a little, little testy over there, isn't it? Hey. Let's get back to uh, Dexter Pittman. We talked about what he learned in college to keep his weight under control. Well, in Texas, you, you talked about in the non-conference season. Then when their season went south, I heard people blame the guard play. Some people blamed uh, Pittman. Uh, but if Pittman's not on the floor, I guess, uh, is that what they meant by blaming him because he wasn't on the floor? Or? Yeah, I mean, they could blame him. They didn't get the production that they had gotten out of him. I guess he built up the expectations early. And once they got into the rugged Big 12 play, his production went down. And, again, some of it was uh, foul trouble. Some of it was they weren't going to him. And some of it was he wasn't de delivering. Andy's with another guest, uh, Danny Ainge of the Boston Celtics. Andy? Well, thanks, Mike. Well, Danny, you guys are up 2-0 on Orlando. You, you look good in green. I see all those guys <laughs> up there. They, I like the green. Billy, good. You look great in green over there. Well, this is not Celtic green, but, uh, you know, we don't want to look like we're pro uh, too much here. But w what changed over the last month with this team to be in position to beat Cleveland and to be up 2-0 on Orlando? Well, first of all, we got healthy. Uh, KG's playing better than he's played, and so is Paul. And then second of all, I think that we just have more resolve. I, I thought this year we didn't necessarily turn a switch on and off, but uh, we came to play in a lot of big games this year and, and played very well up until middle of the fourth quarter, lost double-figure leads too many times. I just didn't think we had that resolve. Like, this is really urgent circumstance. And I think that uh, our resolve is much better, and, and we're you know, playing at the best level we played all year. How would you compare this run with the one you guys had two seasons ago and winning the title? Well, I think this team is better simply because I think Rondo's so much better. And uh, he's clearly becoming a leader on the team. Um, and guys are listening to him. He's a bright kid, and he's playing at a very high level. Let's go back to Rondo. I remember when you guys brought him in for a workout. It was Rondo, Randy Foy, and Marcus Williams. Foy went against each other. Williams sat out. The draft process of guys sometimes not participating, some that do, it benefited Rondo in that situation. How much so? Well, you know, first of all, you know, the draft process started so much earlier. You know, we had fallen in love with Rondo the summer before his sophomore year at Kentucky and had him as one of the top four or five picks in the draft at that time. And then he did not have a good sophomore year. So we were just seeing what it was that we liked so much. And, and you know, in that workout that you're talking about, that was the second workout that we had him in. And he was, a, he was dominant physically. Uh, we knew some of the flaws that he had in his game, but we loved his physical and his mental approach to the game, and, and it's been a real uh, blessing for our team. So with that being said, how critical is some of this process, you know, this kind of uh, workout, and then as you get these guys 
in the gyms against other players? Hey, you know, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think we would have. I think we would have taken Rondo regardless of whether he ever came in for a workout. Um, I think it does solidify some of your thinking sometimes. And uh, but I think it, it it's helpful a little bit. But you know, I'm all for drafting. You know, right after the Final Four too. I have no problem with that. Well, good luck the rest of the series against Orlando. All right, thanks, guys. Well, let's go back to you, Mike. They don't like the green. This color. <laughs> you know, Andy, uh, all these guys would like to look back at their career and say they were NBA lottery picks, uh, but they all can't be. And uh, some of the names on this list, uh, you see Rondo, as uh, Danny Ainge was talking about. And uh, some pretty impressive guys on that list that weren't lottery picks. Sanders was uh, 6'10". I saw the graphic there. He's listed at 6'9". And it also said power forward. He's working with the fives. Does he play center or power forward? at the NBA level? I think sometimes it's interchangeable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, centers will step out 15 feet, knock down jump shots, power forwards will do the dirty work inside. Defensively, he might man the middle as opposed to maybe a center who doesn't have the same athletic skill. So, I mean, I think at that position it's interchangeable. I think it's becoming very interesting now because now we're seeing a lot of power forwards who are able to put the ball down on the ground to shoot the three. Uh, will he be able to have the quickness laterally and uh, the mentality as far as basketball IQ to guard on the perimeter if you were to switch in that pick and pop, pick and roll. Scenario. I think if you're in, if you're in the East and you're drafting, you're saying, okay, does he play center? Does he guard Dwight Howard? That's I mean that's really yeah. what you got to look at. No. And, and no, no. Exactly. and that's what I'm saying. So that's that's why I think like I think certain situations he may play center, certain he may play power forward. It's almost like Sam Dallenbear, great shot blocker, with it, but he has a hard time guarding a Dwight Howard. Where Kendrick Perkins, a wider body, does a much better job guarding Kendrick Perkins. Solomon Alabi here from Florida State. He was projected as a possible top ten pick. Productive season, not really uh, a top ten guy right now. But uh, your thoughts on Solomon? Well, Alabi is one of those guys again that you know he's shown the ability to block shots, to take up the middle. He's got a high IQ for the game. Uh, with that system, Leonard Hamilton's system, very controlled offense, they play terrific defense. You know, the one thing I like about him, you talk a lot about a big guys, oftentimes they don't have great motors. Alabi has a great motor. He's got to play Alibi. hard. Alabi. They, they kept reminding me of that, <laughs> too, because I, I ran the, uh, the the problem earlier by calling him the same thing, but it's Alabi. I think I started off by calling him Alabi, so... Uh, I'm it's the guilty fault. party here. It's it's fault. Fault. I don't want, I don't want to get any leader, letters Mike. from his coach or his mother, <laughs> or even worse, the SID at Florida State, Chuck <laughs> Walsh. The big man's delivering assists. See uh, that? <laughs> I can do that, too. He can do it all. But he, he plays hard. He's got the size to be an NBA center. You know, he's he looks like he has the frame to put on uh, more weight. Yeah. And and a lot of scouts will say that he's further along than Ashim the beat was at the same yeah. age. Yeah. And he went number two in the draft. And then didn't play at all. At <laughs> but, but that may hurt uh, hurt people a little bit when you talk about potential. Yeah. Then you draft a big guy that you expect to come in and play right away, and maybe he doesn't. But you know, not to take anything away from the the Connecticut Husky program, I, I think again playing under a guy like Leonard Hamilton, who is so defensively focused, puts him ahead of the game in, in many ways and understanding you know how to get to position not necessarily blocking shots but how to get to positions and also again a smart guy who's worked on his offense a little bit he can shoot it if he's not you know pushed off the block he's got that jump hook and he's got a little bit of a turnaround jump shot you know Lynn, i think you bring up a great point and i, I remember my year just finally understanding how physical the NBA game really was, especially down low on the blocks. I mean, there were a couple of times I came down there and got my head knocked off. You should off. have asked some of the big men. There <laughs> <laughs> we go. But, you know, you see guys like Solomon Alibi. You, you see Jarvis Bernardo. You see Larry Sanders, Hassan Whiteside, who I'm sure we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. All these guys are tall, athletic, great motors, but very thin and don't have that strong base. Until they gather that strong base, you wonder how much playing time they really and, and the one thing is, how many of these guys will be able to get that base? Because there's a lot of guys people draft to think, okay, we'll put weight on them, they'll get bigger, and they never did. But part of it is technique also, and one of the things that I've seen that maybe Olaby can work on is when you're demanding the ball inside, lower your center of gravity, get down, you know, low man wins, demand the ball once you get it, because it's harder to push you off the block when you've got that low center of gravity as opposed to standing straight up and asking for the ball like a lot of guys do. You know, you know, you, you, you compare him to Jerome Jordan, who we haven't talked about. Jerome Jordan, bigger body, uh, more skilled offensively, 
doesn't have that heartbeat, doesn't have that motor. It seems like that's the case with big men, right? You're either missing one or the other, and, and if you have both, they're the number one pick in the draft. Exactly. Or two, or, or two, three. Or, yeah. two or three. <laughs> well, we're in day one of our two-day coverage here on ESPNU of the 2010 NBA Draft Combine. John Wall, about a month and a few days away from becoming the first pick in the NBA Draft, going to the Washington Wizards. John Lucas down there uh, yelling out directions. Art Parakowski, here he is from Radford. All right, guys, let me just look at my list here. 26 double-doubles in 31 games. I know you're going to say, scouts say, well, he lacks athleticism. This guy put up some pretty good numbers against the likes of, uh, well, Duke. 23 and 14, 21 and 13 against Kansas, 14 and 8 against Louisville. So he did play against some big schools, and he was productive all three times. You took what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, he's 260. I think he uses every pound that he has down low on the block. He's the guy who could play with his back to the basket. Um, he, he did play soccer growing up, which gives him good footwork down low on the blocks. Um, you wonder if he has a lateral quickness to guard a quicker center, somebody who is able to put the ball down the ground and, and make moves. But as far as a back to the basket and a guy who wants to compete every single possession, you know, he is a guy who's unknown on this level, but I, I think he will get drafted somewhere. I, I think if he can find the right fit, uh, he could be a, a good help to the team. Yeah, I mean, you look at guys, look at Gortat for uh, for Orlando, a guy who has some skill as a backup center. I'm sure, you know, he's backing up the, probably the, arguably the best center in, in the NBA basketball, but he's ever bit ever as much valuable in, in many respects as, as Dwight Howard is because he's got a fill-in for Howard. But when you have that size and that strength and you know what your job is and you can get it done in limited minutes, 15, 18 minutes a game, you're going to have a job. And he's got a nice touch. He can step outside a little bit and shoot it. I, you know, I, I like his chances. And again, the fundamentals is really what it comes down to. What kind of footwork does he have inside and does he have a go-to move? You like his chances as a second-round pick, as a free agent? Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a second-round yeah. pick, if anything else. Uh, you know, it comes down to finding somebody who can kind of shore up your bench in the middle. Well, look at his shoulders, too. I mean, yeah. you know, one got in position now you've got the upper body strength to take the bangs and the bumps and finish and then don't forget guys he stayed in school yep that's your theme i want to make sure you keep that going well, i said this is you ESPNU, hoping, you know? and i think we're finding out why it's espnu today all right i'm going to zip it i'm not going to steal any more of your thunder but what's what your thoughts on our you know listen he, he's a big guy and 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 billy's right it's hard to find big guys in the league and you see every year guys that make it because they they can play 5 10 maybe 15 minutes a night and back somebody up and he can do that but uh you know there's no huge expectations i don't think this guy's an nba starter no no and uh and so you take him in the second round and he stayed in school and he stayed in school something to be said for intelligence yeah, yeah exactly you know he's smart enough i'm sure he has his diet right and everything you know i, I let things off talking about his double doubles against those big schools like uh, duke and uh, louisville how much does that uh, hold weight as far as the NBA guys? They say, yeah, okay, whatever, let's see what he can do on the floor. Well, I think against competition, it showed he's competitive, and it shows he can handle the responsibility given to him by, by his teammates and by his coach. All right, we mentioned the fact that uh, draft coming up June the 24th, and Andy Katz standing by right now with the Kentucky Wildcat, John Wall. Well, thanks, Mike. Well, it was, I don't know, it's all a blur. It was like two days ago. We were standing out in Beverly Hills overlooking Los Angeles. The draft lottery announcing the number one pick and all the euphoria that. Now that's settled down. Now you've got to do some work. How much are you focusing in on what you have to accomplish here? I'm focusing on it a lot. You know, is it come out here and show them what you can do, what you've been working on, preparing yourself for. You know, that's all I got to do is go out here and show them what I can do. When I saw you the other day, we talked about the Washington Wizards get the top pick, and you were ecstatic about the possibility of that. Now that there's been a couple of days, what do you think of the realization that they'll make you the selection on June 24th? Well, I think it's a 50-50 chance, you know. I got to work out for them, go see how they like me. I got to meet with my other guys, you know. If, I feel like if any other team with a guy, probably been better. But, you know, it's a 50-50 chance. I'm happy with any situation I got, you know. Just like I tell you before, to be in the draft and have a chance to get picked number one or two means a lot to me and my family. Now that that is over, though, and, and you're going to – end of the workout phase you're going to go down to tampa what do you think you need to continue to work on on your game before you get into summer league oh pick and roll definitely you know that's what a lot of teams run you know working on changing speeds in my jump shot you know those are three things the key that i think i need to work on you know like i said they go on the ball screens a lot so if i'm knocking that shot down it and give me a better chance to get into the lane and get my teammates open and win games and you know stand in shape 
what could you have accomplished if you had participated in this basketball portion? Uh, I think, you know, just showing them that I can shoot, you know, what I've been working on. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't do this. I'm going to do the agility stuff. So this guy's showing what I can do there. Five Kentucky players could go in the first round, more than likely. When you guys all assembled earlier in the fall, how much did you think that was a possibility? Uh, not really. You know, everybody probably knew I was going to probably leave more than likely. But, you know, I didn't want to think about it or focus on it. And some of the other guys didn't think they had a chance. But like I said, we win games, we stick together as a team, and we win. You know, you might have a chance at the end of the year. So a lot of kid, a lot of players coming in was under the radar. You know, they stepped up, played big this season for us, and then they have a shot at their dream is to play in the NBA. You told me when you went to the Laker game on Monday night, you were watching Kobe Bryant's footwork. What do you need to improve on with your footwork, with any kind of your, your vision in terms of playing the point position that you can do between now and the fall? Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. You know, Kobe has this great footwork. That's what a lot of players in NBA doesn't have. You know, they got footwork, but he has extremely good footwork. You know, he, he stops on a dime and can spin different ways and sh make shots out of it. So and that's going to come from hard work and dedication, staying in the gym and working on it. But like I said, you want to be a, a, a talented player, all-star in the NBA, you have to work on a lot of things, and that's one of them. Three straight seasons, Derrick Rose, Tyreek Evans, and now you have all played for John Calipari. They're all going to be lottery picks. What is it about the way he has coached you guys that has put you guys in this position? Uh, like I said, any, any guard that can get to the basket and likes to win, you can play for Coach Kyle, you know. He's going to develop you to become a better player. he got great coaching staff around him and Coach Ross Strickland, guys like that. So if you go in there willing to work and put in the work like us guys did and just listen to what Coach Kyle is telling you, you got a chance. Well, good luck, John. All right, thank you. Let's go back to you, Mike. Hey, All right, thanks a lot. It must be so tough to be Andy Katz. I tell you, you yeah. know, we're in Beverly Hills. We're overlooking L.A. <laughs> I travel the, the country in 36 hours. Tough gig. Must yeah. be tough to be John Calipari. Look at the one and done under Coach Cal, huh? Evans, Rose, Williams, Dewan Wagner. Well, it seems like yesterday, Dewan Wagner was uh, coming out of high school after scoring all those points in Jersey. Thanks. You recruit we were the same those... year. Thanks. We were the same year. You recruit those guys. You know what you're in yeah. for. Well, you know, since the, the rule was instant. Yeah, and the one thing, Calipari sort of become like that quarterback. He's a point guard. You know, you, you go there, you have a chance to go right to the NBA as a point guard because he's had some great ones there. Yeah, we've talked about John Wall several times here this afternoon and uh, or this day, but obviously a special talent. Is he a franchise type guy or is he just a good building block to uh, for a good foundation? He said he could have showed the people he could shoot the basketball here, but he didn't. So obviously that's his agent, right? Um, I, I, I would have liked to hear it from his mouth instead of him kind of dancing around it. The direct question is, why aren't you here? I would love to have heard the answer. I did like that Andy gave him the opportunity to describe what he would have do, done hypothetically had he been out here. <laughs> I would have messed up. I would have dribbled off. Yeah. But, I mean, I just don't know. I mean, a lot of Andy's questions today has just been, you know, what do you think? been a little weak. Yeah. Well, you know, guys, I mean, to his defense, uh, I kind of went through the same scenario. You can imagine if you're doing a little closeout drill, and all of a sudden you, you twist or you turn your, you, you crack your ankle, Lynn. I know, I know you hate to say it, but it's still possible. I mean, for a guy who's going to be your number one pick, why would you even want to risk that? No, you're right. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody knows he can I shoot know, the basketball. Come on, come on. Let's Let's say you, you're, you're still no. doing some closeout no, drills, no, man. No, no, Medical technology, there's hardly anything he can do out here. It might defer him. I mean, you you, you got to come out here and you got to demonstrate or confirm. He's and if nothing else, show you're right? not afraid. So what? But he's going he's gonna to do it. He's, he's going to do, do it for Washington. Then don't come here then. Why, why is he, though, right? if he's the number one pick in the draft, why is he getting a vertical leap? Why is he doing all of those measurement drills? Just don't come. Because I don't, I don't, because I don't I buy that. Because I Washington will probably work out him, and they'll work out Evan Turner and maybe some other guys. So, so he's going to work out there as well. Hey, can you explain to me why he's going to be the number one pick, but Evan Turner was the national player of the year? I mean, it's okay. apples and oranges, I understand. It's, but. it's, Wait, it's one, upside. Yeah. One more question. How many more workouts is he going to have? He'll probably have the Washington workout, and what else? That's it. That's it. I mean, and that's not I mean, even going to be a workout. Saying, that's that's going to be a workout. Visit. Come that's on, I've be been through. Visit. I had one workout with Chicago with a second pick, another workout with Golden State with the first pick that year, and not the third pick, and that was it. If Evan Turner, if he had to break down his game, if he had any weaknesses, what would they be? He's, he's not a blow-by athlete, and he's not a great shooter. No. Now, I think he'll improve his jump shot because he works on his game. Um, he's never going to be a blow-by athlete. But he's made guys better on the college level, and that says a lot on this level. And, and, and people also, better. also in the NBA, you don't need to be a blow-by athlete in, in order to score points. I mean, I remember playing against Sam Cassell towards the latter part of his career, and Sam might have been the slowest guy on the court, and Slam was still giving me 30-plus a game. Because Sam was smart, and I think he understood how to play. Like, Larry Bird wasn't a blow-by, but he was smart enough to know how to get you to foul him, how to get by you. Speed sometimes can be a detriment because guys don't know how to use it.
I thought sometimes Evan Turner, maybe because he had to put the team on his back, sometimes he, he penetrated too deep sometimes and got into trouble and, and lost the ball. But that's the only negative I could come up with. But obviously he won't have to do He's that. He's ranked number two on my big board. So, I mean, it's all, you know, it's relative, right? It's just relative to one other guy in the draft. I mean, well, you say he's an average athlete. Boy, that's raising the bar. High, I, I thought he was pretty good. Well, I mentioned the fact that John Wall is not participating today. He will be tomorrow. But Sharon Collins uh, from Kansas, he's here. He's working. And Ryan, when we come to these draft combines, usually everyone's got everyone scouted, a lot of college players that everyone knows. But already your name has popped up because they're not as familiar with you. What did you need to prove here on Thursday to sort of get their attention? Uh, I think I need to prove that I was versatile. You know, uh, seven foot is versatile. They can handle the ball, shoot the ball, and just go hard, you know, intensity. And I think that was it. I think I did a good job today. In a way, I mean, how much of an advantage could it be for you that these guys have been scouted at nauseum, so they sort of know everything about them? You, they didn't. How yeah. much of an edge could that be for you? I think, yeah, I think it is definitely an edge. It helps because, you know, your company is a mystery. Nobody knows what you can do. And, uh, you know, as long as you do a good job, then, you know, it's definitely going to be an advantage. What did you do this past season overseas that you feel is a good jumping off point to go into the NBA? Um, I think I helped my team when I first arrived to the team. They wasn't a playoff team. We reached the playoffs. We got knocked out in the first round, but... Uh, I really helped the team defensively and also helped them scoring the ball. So I did a great job there, and uh, it was a real important role. You know, at ESPN, we have this thing called a bio-blast, where we sort of get to know a player real quickly, a couple of nuts and bolts. Give you, if you can give our viewers, the bio-blast on Ryan at Richards, who you are and what you can do. Okay, uh, I'm Ryan Richards uh, from England, and uh, I can score the basketball. What about defensively? Uh, defensively, you know, I can guard inside-outside. All right, well, we, see, we may see Ryan Richards as that surprise player somewhere on the draft board. Let's go back to you guys. Thanks, Andy. Uh, you had mentioned he's making some money for he and his agent here today. Uh, earlier we said he'd be staying in Europe. Any chance that uh, no, that, that helps him. That? that helps him because you, you look at teams that have multiple first-round picks. You've got the New Jersey Nets. You have Oklahoma City. You have Memphis with three. Uh, you have uh, Minnesota Timberwolves have three. They... they most teams don't want two, three rookies on your roster, on the roster space for him. So this allows him to continue to develop in Europe. They don't have to pay the guy. He gets off the cap. That's also a big issue uh, for a lot of teams. So that they, they actually like that. Uh, and so I actually think that, that helps him. He's going to stay in Europe good. Well, I, I think the one thing he and his agent got to decide is where is he going to go in the first round? Because if he's going to go late in the first round, late in the 20s, he may want to pull his name out and play overseas again and try to get, move up in the draft. I don't think you want to just be in the draft just to be in it. Um, and maybe somebody tell you to stay over there and play anyway. So you might as well play over there, get paid, and then try to move up in the draft a little later. But you know the history of international guys, the hype, and every year that they stay, they drop. And uh, that's that's typically the way that it goes with international but he guys. But now, by his showing here and everybody talking about him, he may have a good chance to make more money in a, in Italy or, or, or some, a Greece yeah. someplace over there and make a lot more money than he did last year. And I can see how guys might drop because, again, you, you defer a year. Some of these coaches want to get their hands on you now mm -hmm. while you're still malleable, while you're still coachable mm -hmm. to their game. Yeah. You know, obviously, the European game is good. That, that's for basketball players. Uh, the NBA game, to me, is more for athletes who happen to play basketball, uh, and it's the hybrids who are most successful. You know, this guy has demonstrated he's got the fundamental skills, etc. Now it's time to exploit that athleticism and teach him how to play the NBA game. So I think it's a tough decision, yeah. and I agree with you. If he's a second or third of three first-round picks, yeah. maybe another year would certainly help. You know, I think it's a predicament. A lot of kids are stuck in these days where it's like, do you want to essentially come out and serve an internship for three years, three or four years, and learn the NBA game, which is completely different, I think, yeah. than the overseas game. Or maybe you you might get more money from having a lot more hype built around your name after this free draft camp. But then going over to Italy and actually having expectations risen on you, rised on you, and you really not be able to live up to those expectations. So it's a very difficult It's the curse of make. Thiago yeah. Splitter, who was in like 10 <laughs> exactly. drafts. Yeah. Yeah. And every year he dropped five spots in the draft. Yeah. And, you know, he actually turned into a pretty good European player. And I know the Spurs want to finally bring him over. And they think he's ready to contribute now. We have about 15 minutes to go on the uh, broadcast uh, today. Let's take a look at the, uh, as Jay said, the guys who win championships. Here's the uh, the point guards and the combination guards. There's a list. You see at the top of the list there, Eric Bledsoe, one of five Kentucky Wildcats. What kind of numbers does he put up if John Wall is not part of that equation? 
Well, you saw him in the very first game Kentucky played, which John Wall was ineligible for. He came out and had a big game for Kentucky. I think that he got on the radar immediately for NBA scouts. Uh, you know, he's got the NBA athleticism. He's got um, the body. He's got the toughness, the defense. Uh, I, I think if he'd been on another college basketball team where he was featured more, I, I think he would have been a lock for the lottery. I saw him and John actually go head-to-head -head a couple of times, and he did extremely, extremely well. Now, when they play John, obviously, the basketball, and, and makes a lot of big-time plays, but also watching him, if you watch him just hang around the basket in warm-ups, he might be one of the most athletic guys in this draft. I mean, I, I've seen him do a couple of things in warm-ups where literally I, w I was in awe. My mouth almost dropped to the floor. He has that kind of athletic ability. He did something you couldn't do? Yeah, he did a lot of things I couldn't do, Lynn. Trust me. Oh, you had Calipari out loud wondering which one was the better athlete between Wall yeah, and, very and, true. and Bledsoe. And that's Cal's way of putting that competition out there, too. No, speaking I'm of Cal. You, it's true. I mean, this kid has uh, – I can't wait for tomorrow to see what his vertical jump is going to be. It might be off the charts and one of the best in the entire camp. So he plays second fiddle to uh, Jonathan Wall. Speaking of John Calipari and recruiting – is it true that he could have played second fiddle again next year to the, uh, the recruit coming in? Brandon well, yeah, Knight. Brandon Knight coming in. No. And uh, I think Bledsoe would have played more than him, but, you know, then, then Brandon Knight may decide to go where, elsewhere. I mean, you know, this is all part of the process. You saw John almost encouraging Bledsoe to go ahead and, and get in the draft, and, you know, I think, I think that was a sign. Uh, he's another guy. We have no idea where his draft stock's going to be because – Teams are still figuring out what they want to do with him. He could go very high. I could see him go as high as 10 to Indiana. They need a point guard. He'd be a very good fit there. I don't think he, he lasts past 20 of them. And also, he, he's a pit bull as far as, as, far as an on-the-ball defender. I mean, he'll get oh, yeah. after. He'll turn you three or four times before you get to half court. He has upper body strength to really bang, to take that, that abuse physically. And so that's a strong small guard. I mean, and he's quick, and he can shoot. I, I, I can't wait to see the workouts with him and Avery Bradley oh. uh, going at it, because that is going to be an intense workout, because both of those guys are bulldogs, on-the-ball defenders. They're both very quick. They're both very athletic. I, I think they're two guys that didn't show as well in, in college as they're going to show in the pros. Yeah, but the agents won't let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> you may be right about that. You know, he, he did get 30 minutes a game, though. I mean, looking at Kentucky, the final stats. So, basically, we're not looking at his numbers. We're looking at the upside again, right? And, and the position, you know, Russell Westbrook did the same thing. Right. UCLA played with Darren Collison, right? And, and deferred a little bit to Darren Collison. We weren't able to see all Russell, Russell Westbrook could do until we saw him at Oklahoma City. Right. It could be the system. It also could be the fact that you got somebody a little bit better and you play a support role. Look at Drew Holiday. I mean, he didn't put up numbers, but yet, you know, he's a significant piece in, in the 76ers. Uh, so you take a look at the last five seasons now, the underclassmen declaring uh, for the draft, 80 here in 2010. That's six more than uh, last year in 2009. Grievous Vasquez of Maryland, he bounced back and had a huge 2009-2010 uh, season. I guess the fact that if you played last year and you were invited back this year, that in itself is a positive. Well, he's ACC player of the year, and obviously it would be tough to leave. He had a dominant season. You know, he led his team. He improved vastly, particularly in cutting down on turnovers, able to take over offensively. And, and, you know, he played pretty good defense. I mean, there were times when obviously he'd run out of defense, gamble a little bit, but he's just a much improved player. And all four of those guys, the fact that they went last year, learned something about themselves and how the league thought about them, and they came back and improved and were reinvited. Tells you that was a win-win situation. He's had an outstanding workout regimen. I mean, before each Maryland game, he's there an hour before. The guys even come out to warm up, and he's using a tennis ball to try to get feel, and he's able to do a lot of things, and he goes into a shooting routine. He does it before every game, and I think that's probably what he learned. You know, that there are things he needs to work on, there are things he needs to be more meticulous with, and including the details, and one of them was workout habits. And the thing, though, he's not the most explosive guy, right. but he has an uncanny style of game. He can use the screen and roll, and he's vocal. And I like that from my point guard, somebody who can direct. There have been times throughout the game where some of their front court players for Maryland were young, so they didn't know where they were actually position-wise on the court. He was directing guys and to say, no, you come here, calm the offense down, and lead that team offensively. Another guard that's here, uh, Kansas, uh, Sharon Collins. His, his size obviously working against him, but he is one gritty son of a gun, isn't he? He's gritty. He's, he's a great athlete. He has an amazing crossover, probably the best crossover uh, that you know, you'll see here. 
the one thing that we were talking about Vasquez, Vasquez, I think he's a perfect fit for the Lakers. Some coaches right. don't want small guards. Phil Jackson likes big guards. I think he fits perfect for them. In that triangle system, he would fit yeah. perfectly. And, and, you know, I think the thing about Sharon, you know, I've watched I'm a huge Kansas fan. I, I've watched him for four years. I watched him in the workout. He, he's an alpha dog. He, he needs the ball in his hands. He's a leader. He's a natural leader out there. And he's been such a dominant player. Will he be able to make the transition to the NBA where he's going to be a role player now? He's going to be asked to do certain things. I just don't know if he has that makeup mentally to make that transition. He may be much happier going overseas where he can be a dominant player. Well, real quick, I, I looked at the situation with Sharon Collins. Bill Self told him this year you got to be more of a point guard. There are no 5'10 shooting guards that are doing anything. He made that adjustment. I think he's competitive enough to say, I'll play the role, and ultimately I'll get the job. Well, we're almost uh, set to uh, cap off uh, day one's coverage here. Let's check in with Andy uh, Katz. Andy, your final thoughts today. Well, what I thought was interesting is this is the first time that we've seen that underclassmen have not been able to test the draft process. And in talking to some of the players that you guys were just mentioning that were here a year ago, those guys like Luke Karen Gody, like Damian James, like Gravis Vasquez, they were able to sort of test their draft status and then go back to school. Well, the NCAA took that away from these players by that early withdrawal date from the draft of May 8th. And I do think there are some players here that had they just test themselves, might have gone back to school and may not have made a mistake. And I think this is going to be a rule that the NCAA is going to really have to be careful about as they go forward, as more players potentially don't get a chance to test themselves and stay in the draft and either get in the second round or don't get drafted at all. All right, thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, Jay, your thoughts today? Well, I think some people came out impressed. Ryan Richards came out impressed. I think he built up a lot of hype over today. But uh, mostly for today, it was, it was a great chance for a lot of these guys to come in and get their feet wet. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of anticipation. Nerves are a little unsettled when they come in. So today, kind of figuring it out, taking their time, getting their drill set down. But the thing for the most part, everybody did come out here and compete pretty hard. Yeah, and to me, it was Ryan Richards. But the biggest thing, being a former GM, I'm just glad nobody got hurt because I think they were able to come in and show. But now they can continue on and have another great day tomorrow. Yeah, for me, it's about the equation. You're talking about potential, athleticism, and skills. Potential they saw throughout the year. Today was about seeing where the skills are. Tomorrow, obviously, athleticism. But the one thing I will say about this rule that Andy commented on is the fact that, you know, if you're going to err, then err on the side of development, err on the side of increasing your education and development. Because to me, you know, guys understand what, what's at stake. And you can go to Europe. You don't have to go play in the NCAA anymore if this is the decision you make. Most guys run to the NBA and are running away from school instead of making that decision based on the talent. Uh, you know, I think I like Ryan Richards. I, I think Paul George looked well. And, you know, the other comment that I would say is that if, if this broadcast was a drinking game and the key word was back to school, you would be plastered right now. <laughs> Work for me. <laughs> a drinking game. Wow. A drinking Interesting game. analogy. Hey.